Alrighty, everyone. Welcome to this week's live stream. I thought today we would talk about working with acrylic. And, uh, you know, I've got, I don't know, 15 years of experience doing this. So it's a topic I know a lot about, and maybe I can give you some insight on. So I tried to set up <clears throat> my cameras a little differently today. And uh, hopefully it'll all work out the way we like. So for now, there's somebody. We got one person. Okay, we can start the stream. <laughs> I'm Michael. Hi, Click Clacks. So hope you guys are staying safe and, uh, you know, you're avoiding the plague that is everywhere. And uh, we'll see what happens, you know. I'm trying to be positive in a very difficult time. But, uh, you know, life must go on. And so we are here hanging out, and it's nice to be able to catch up with you guys every Saturday. We do a live stream um, 2 o'clock Central Time every Saturday here in Texas. And, uh, you know, a bunch of you guys watch. Some of you would like to listen to it later on and don't see anything. This one should be visual for the first 45 minutes or so. And then, uh, you know, we're going to go into question and answer. And, you know, if you don't want to have the camera on at that point, I totally get it. But we'll run some uh, aquarium footage in the background, assuming I can get that to cooperate today. So you have something to look at. But uh, in the meantime, I thought we could talk about working with acrylic and some of the tools I use to start with. So I've got a couple of cameras set up. So you've got here is one angle, and then we've got another angle for a potential little demo. <clears throat> so I thought I'd do that with you guys today. <laughs> Um, so when it, first of all, when it comes to working with acrylic, you're going to need a certain set of tools. In the description of this video, I've already put the link, so it's available to you right now if you want to jump to your browser and open it up. It shows a lot of the tools that I've been using to hold things in place, how to glue, how to route, um, what blades you should use for a table saw, that kind of stuff. My business started off with a table saw and a hand router, and it wasn't long after that I bought something called a jointer. <clears throat> because scraping the edges of the acrylic by hand sounded insane to me, so I kind of jumped right into that, and that's in there. Uh, also, when it comes to drilling holes in acrylic, uh, I recommend certain hole saws. There are lots of options out there. You definitely do not need diamond tip bits like you do for glass. Um, usually when you're cutting a hole through acrylic, you can use a regular drill bit, you can use the uh, paddle bits if you're slow, you know, take your time. Uh, I really like hole saws like you would use to put holes in wood for doorknobs, and those things are great. And I have a whole bunch of those uh, that I used over the years. But ever since I got Minion, which has now been over three years, she does a lot of this for me after I program it all into the computer. And I say, I want a hole here, and I want, uh, you know, I mean, well, for example, this item right here has a lot of holes in it. <clears throat> so you've got normal size holes for frag plugs, you've got drip holes to let out liquid, you've got holes here that'll fit one inch PVC pipe through it for a work tray that hangs over your tank and lets you work in the tank and let it drip back into the reef and then take things out of here and put it back in the water and grab the next thing and put it in. I thought this would be a super handy thing and a few people have bought it and really liked it. I made it with, it has legs on the side so you can set it down on the counter and the frag plugs aren't gonna plop out of all the little holes back here. So it's kind of a nice little thing that was made with Minion that would have been much harder to make just from scratch, kind of, you know, shall we just call it DIY. You know, the whole do it your, <clears throat> The whole do-it-yourself concept is uh, limited to <clears throat> what you can do with your tools. I have a frog in my throat today, guys. I apologize. This is my fourth stream this week. So, uh, yeah, I've been using up my voice. Um, okay, so first of all, what kind of acrylic is the right kind to use? And a lot of people say, can I use plexiglass? Plexiglass is a brand name of a type of acrylic. What we really care about is are you using extruded? acrylic or cast acrylic. Extruded is uh, cheaper, it's a little less strong, the clarity is not quite as good, and it will, uh, you know, it'll do the job. Lots of, you know, I mean, all my sumps are made out of extruded acrylic. But if you're looking for a higher quality of material, then you buy cast acrylic. You know, so like I said, it costs you a little bit more. And actually, you know, I used extruded for a long time, and I just realized as I was saying it out loud, I switched to pretty much cast acrylic for everything I do. So, I guess I jumped, uh, up one notch on the list of uh, different materials I use. Uh, I really like to use quarter inch acrylic and 3 8 Those are the two I, I live in. Um, I very rarely get anything thicker. Occasionally someone will say, hey, I want a uh, half inch such and such. 
and I will get exactly enough to make that one exact little piece they wanted just because of the demand. But uh, for the most part, quarter inch works for most projects, and three eighths are for those projects that are bigger that hold more water volume. So example, <clears throat> if something is holding more than 60 gallons of water, I automatically go to three eighths because it's thicker and more durable and less likely to bulge out in the center. So like a lot of people might say, well, I want to make a small little tank, or I want to make a sump, or I want to make a quarantine tank, or I want to make a frag tank. And so when it comes to that, you want to have the right amount of thickness based on what you're going to put in it. And the other thing you need to realize is that the taller the tank becomes, the thicker the material must become. So if uh, I had someone just recently ask me you know, if I could melt, make him a frag tank that was eight inches tall. And I know for a fact, because I did it myself, I made one out of eighth inch that was uh, three eighths acrylic. It only held 10 gallons of water, and yet the tank bowed outward in the middle. It was three quarters of an inch wider in the center than it was on the ends. And there was nothing you could do to pull it together. I mean, it just, that's what it did because it was rimless. And I, for a very long time, have told people, if you're going to go rimless, use glass. If you want to, uh, you know, use acrylic, then you need to have a top flange on the top that holds it into a nice square piece to keep it, you know, make it more strong and avoid that bulging out at the center. My frag tank that I made, that's 60 gallons of water, it's made of 3 eighths, and I measured it uh, <clears throat> last week. When you look at it from the end, you can kind of see a slight bow, and apparently it's about a quarter of an inch. Still enough to bother me, but I mean, you know, most people might say, whatever, that's fine. But I, you know, I, I like things to be nice and straight and true and exact, just like when you're building a home or anything else, you know, you want everything to be precise. So, uh, you, so we've talked about acrylic versus, ex, uh, cast versus extruded, cast is better. It's going to be, it's easier to drill through. It doesn't get as hot as quickly. So, you know, like I said, the drill bit goes through it. Uh, the clarity is much better. Uh, weight wise is about a wash. So that makes no difference. Then when you are <clears throat> wanting to put anything together, first thing you have to do is you have to lay out what you're going to uh, make. So for example, let's just take something here I'll throw on the table. So what I've got here is a beginning of a fan tray. And the way it works is I will be gluing these pieces on here. And that way you can put a cooling fan here and a cooling fan here and then there's a couple of rails that go on the side. And for me to do this, I need to make sure everything's the right size. So I don't even have the rails cut out yet, so I can't even show you that. But I made sure that these pieces are the same width as the actual fan tray. So when it's all glued together, it's all one piece, and I can glue my sides on the edge, and that's what gives it its strength so it won't bow. Now let's show you something different. <clears throat> this one here, I'll turn it this way for you is going to be one of those power brick holders. And so I've got these pieces here that have a notch in them for the Velcro strap that's going to hold the power brick there. And these are going to glue on one by one, two inches apart, all the way up the piece. And when you're trying to glue it, obviously things are going to want to wander around. So what you really need are jigs. And jigs are things that keep it in place so it won't wiggle while the, the glue is setting or as the bond is happening. You're going to have to pull off all the paper because you cannot have the paper on there or if there's a plastic film, you've got to remove it because the glue will wick right into the plastic or the paper and ruin or mar the surface of the acrylic and we don't want to ruin the look. So this is an example of what one looks like when you're about to glue it. And again, the width of this is the same size as the piece underneath. And then here is the finished product. So you can see it's got holes at the top to mount it in the board right here and here. And then you've got your shelves, and you're able to secure the power bricks there so they don't jump off for some reason if you're pulling on the cords. And that is a final product after it's already been glued. So I do want to show you how I glue something. I think the easiest thing to show you would be to show you how to make a skimmer stand. So we'll take this out of the way. I don't want to do something that takes forever, you know. So here's a common skimmer stand that I make. And this one here is... 11 and a half inches by 11 and a half inches by two and a quarter inches tall. And that's actually kind of a common height for a lot of the skimmer stands that I make. They, uh, <clears throat> this is all quarter inch. The edge here has been beveled a little bit so it's not sharp. Uh, the ends here are rounded over and then everything's been, you know, heated up with a torch to make it so it doesn't look uh, rough. It gives it a nice soft look on the edges, which I like. And you can see we've got some very nice seams here. 
that you can look right through and there's not like a million bubbles. And that's the biggest thing. People want to avoid the bubbles. So what we'll do, we'll make a small skimmer stand for my tank sitter really quick. So here's my piece that was cut out on by Minion. <clears throat> I already rounded over the edge, so that part's completed, and the corners are rounded. That was done by the CNC machine, and then I took a router and went around the edge. Now the router bit that I use is this one right here. And what it's got is it's got a bearing that will trace the edge of the acrylic, and then the blade itself will cut the curl. That gives me that nice little soft bend right here. And I use this router right here to do it. So this is a handheld laminate trimmer, and there's the bit, there's the bearing. Right there, the silver part, that is the, uh, the cutting blade. There's one on each side as this thing turns around. And this is not plugged in, by the way, <laughs> in case anyone's thinking, oh my god! And by adjusting it, all you do is loosen this lever, and then turn the knob, and that will show how much of the blade shows, or how little of it shows. So you're actually adjusting the depth of how far it'll cut down. So that's how this works, and I really like this little router. I got this one at Home Depot a few years ago. So the first thing you have to do to glue it, like I said before, is to remove the paper. And this is probably the most tedious part of my job, is peeling off paper and, you know, getting the edge to lift when you're first starting. I like to keep my fingers off the acrylic as much as possible. I also will clean it, so I have a soft cloth. This is denatured alcohol in a spray bottle, which at Home Depot, it's denatured alcohol is also listed as fuel. So you can just wipe off your acrylic and make it nice and clean so there's no hand oils or anything like that on there. And you're not rubbing it with a whole bunch, it's just a swipe. And then you need something to mark the acrylic, and this is a pen that you, I just wiped it, but whatever. Um, when you write on there, you want to be able to remove it when you're done. See, it wipes right off. So, you want to be able to put a mark on there to give you, an, you know, a visual of where you're going to put something. <clears throat> and in this case, I'm going to put my stand, or my legs, one inch from the inside. So I put a little mark here. I put a little one here. And then we'll do the same on the other side. And then we need something to hold the leg in place. So here is one of the legs. I'm going to go ahead and I've already uh, sanded the edge so it's nice and smooth. I'm going to pull off the paper. If this was a bigger piece, I would just peel back a little bit, just the part I'm going to glue. But since this is the entire leg, I'm just removing all the paper. But most projects, you want to leave on as much material, paper material as possible to protect it from getting scratched or scuffed. So here's our first piece that's going to go right up against those marks. And as you can see, it wants to wiggle. So we want to stabilize it. So I have a handy dandy chunk of wood that I use as my jig. Move some things out of my way. Now here's an example of one jig. I have lots of different ones. I probably have 10 jigs here. And this has a couple of the Ecotech magnets I use when I want to hold things in place. I'm going to remove those now and I'm going to remove them off camera because I just don't want them getting near each other or they'll snap together. <clears throat> Alright, those are all separated a foot apart. Now I can take my block of wood and I can place it right here on top of the table. The bottom is nice and smooth so it can't scratch the acrylic. Because remember our acrylic is bare, it's naked, we don't want it to get ruined. And I'm going to line this up. And then if there was a need I'm not going to, well, I could, mm, no, it's too small a leg, it just can't do it. Uh, and I'm going to scoot this over just a little bit, and I'm going to try to zoom in for you. Plus, we've got another angle. How about this one right here? That's pretty good. All right. So what we've got going on now is we are ready to apply the glue, but we need to lift the acrylic up slightly. So I'm going to be doing this handheld, but I don't want this piece to move. <clears throat> so I've got a a weight bag here. I'm just going to put it right in the middle, and that's going to keep this thing from wiggling too much. So the weight bag is right there, and then here's our piece. So I'm just going to put a, a small acupuncture needle, oh, sorry, I'm holding the wrong 
at the wrong angle, sorry. So here is the needle. It's very, very fine. I believe it's 0 0.035, and I've been using the same needles for years. They last forever. And you would put one under the acrylic on one end. My arm's totally in the way. And then one under the other end. You gotta lift it up slightly to get it in there. And now you wanna make sure it's centered. All right, and now I'm gonna to try to glue this upside down so you can see, so I gotta kind of change my angle here. Uh, so we've got, the next thing I have to show you, sorry. This is a needle tip applicator. This has my solvent in there. This is an example of that applicator bottle. This is the baby bottle. This is the large bottle by comparison. So this is really good for like, you know, we just have to do a little bit of touch up work. It's not gonna be good for a big project. And then these needles are replaceable. And you can buy those in a package. I think it's two or three in a package. And so you can actually just unscrew one from the tip and screw another one on, take off the protective cap. And that's how you end up with this. A needle tip applicator is important because this is really, really watery. As you can see, it moves like crazy. <clears throat> all right, so now that I've shown you all that, switch to the other camera again. And I'm gonna try and glue upside down so my fingers aren't in the way. So I'm gonna hold this one steady, put the bottle in place, and I squeeze gently. And the, the seam is already way ahead of the bottle. It just reached the other end and I'm still traveling. And that's it. We're gonna leave that alone for about 30 seconds. And I make sure that nothing's moving. I don't do anything to shake the table or touch the jig or do any kind of change that could affect my outcome because I want this to be done. I want it to be done right. I want it to look good. And then uh, after 30 seconds, we're gonna pull out the pin. And here from above, you can see it. It's the acrylic is up against the board. If this was a taller piece of acrylic, I could put a little clamp here to squeeze it there and keep it nice and straight. Because sometimes acrylic will bow. And when that happens, you've got to put it toward the jig where the bow is in the center and take a clamp to pull it so it becomes nice, rigid, straight. Okay, another, another 15 seconds. We can actually zoom in a little bit here. Can we? It's where I did this before the show. It would let me zoom. Now it won't. All right, well, so be it. And then when I pull those pins out, I'm gonna put a finger here to keep it in place. I'm gonna pull out the pins and then I'm gonna push down slightly, which is gonna cause some of the solvent to push out or, or bubble up on the edge, just a little bit, but it retracts as it dries. A uh, side note, whenever you're gluing, you wanna be in a low humidity environment. The higher the humidity in your room, the more likely the glue will turn white and it'll look ugly. So to avoid that, you wanna keep your humidity under 60%. Um, lower even is even better. <clears throat> so that feels like about 30 seconds or so. So we'll pull out the pin, pull out the other pin, and I press down and hold. So I can switch to this for you. So you can kind of see how the glue oozed up here, but that won't be ugly in the end. It'll look fine. And you want to make sure your piece is on the platform and not hanging off the edge. In this case, because it's a stand, and this is the final version. There's not any after work that has to be done. Okay, so that's one side. Any questions? Now's your chance to ask the question about what I just did. Uh, the acupuncture needles that I got, I got from a friend. He sent me a whole bunch once, they were exactly what I needed. And when I tried to get more, somebody sent me something that looked completely different. And I had the original packaging, I had the original like dimensional size, but what he sent me was like the finest fiber. It was so thin, it was thinner than hair, thinner than anything. I wanted more, uh, you know, I wanted the correct needle size. And I know that this is so, impart so impossible to judge. You know, what size is that? And you can see it's curled. And it's curled because when I use it and I stick it under a piece of acrylic, I want the handle to be sticking up and not lying down. If this piece of, if this needle was completely straight and just sitting in there and you put the glue down the seam, the glue would follow the needle and you'd have this stupid line going across your acrylic work ruining it. So I want them to stand up. And there's all kinds of things I use, whatever's handy, to keep the handle from floop, falling over. Even if it's like a chapstick stuck right here just temporarily so that one won't wiggle because it's the one that seems to want to dance the most. And uh, yeah, like I said, I've probably been using the same 
This needle I've probably been using for five or six years. <laughs> and I have about 30 needles in my little bin that I use at all times. So now how long does this have to sit on the spot that's been glued? It needs to be like that for probably about five minutes or so before you can make a change. If you have enough space, if this was a bigger project, or I had the perfect jig in the middle that was able to do rail one and rail two, I would do that. You know, I would glue this one, glue that one, and walk away for 10 minutes. But in this case, I need to wait for the one to set, and then I'm gonna move the block over about an inch and a half, and then I have to do the second leg. And so as I'm working on a project, I will work on a few different projects at the same time. So let me show you the next step of something different. I've had some people that have been asking me, where's my order? <laughs> so they get, if they're watching the stream, they're gonna see it today. So this right here is a large triple dosing container that has three compartments. I believe this one probably is gonna hold like 1.3 gallons per zone. So it's a nice container and it's already been glued together. So we've got, you know, the ends are glued on, the dividers are glued in, and I've routed the edge so it's, it's already been cut clean, and I've rounded the edge so that it's nice and smooth. The next step I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna have to sand the surface of every single one of these intersections. So you got two, four, six, eight corners that have to be hit, and then I have to sand the other eight. It's not fun sanding, trust me. And when I sand, and I'm not gonna show you it because it's gonna be noisy, but I have a sanding block that's just a piece of acrylic with a type of sandpaper that's stuck on that has glue on the back. You know, just, you know, a peel and stick. And I will just take the edge and I'll just round and round and round until it's completely smooth. And I can tell it'll look completely sanded. Go to the next corner, go to the middle, go to the next middle, vice versa. Do the whole thing. And then when it's all completely sanded, I have to blast it with an air compressor to get all the dust off of it. I wipe it down with my denatured alcohol so it's nice and smooth and clean and no oils. And then the piece that goes on top could be this one right here, which is gonna be the top of the dosing container. And that gives them their zones. And then this piece is gonna go on the bottom of the container, which is blue acrylic. And it's gonna fit underneath. So you can see it looks like that. And as you can notice, the piece is bigger than the, than the box. That's intentional, which leads me to my next demonstration. So here is one that's been glued together already. This is a two zone dosing container. And the uh, box itself was already glued together. Then the top was put on and the bottom was put on. And as you can see, there's a big overhang on all four sides. I'm trying to get you the best angle here. There we go. So I need that overhang to be gone. And the way I get rid of this overhang is with a different router bit. So this is the router bit that I use. And I'll switch cameras so you can see it better. Let me do this down here. Switch really quick so you can see it. This is something you can find at Home Depot. It's a Diablo blade. No, Freud blade, I'm sorry. Diablo's their other one. Uh, Freud blade, and this one here is a quarter inch shank, which means it fits a quarter inch router shank, or the uh, call it. And then the top half, uh, I believe it's half inch. Let me read it really quick, because I can't remember. Um, I think this one, man, I can't even tell when I'm looking at the darn thing. I think it's three eighths in diameter. So the reason I like this bit specifically, and what I'm talking about is this is, I want the width of that, whatever that is. It could be three eighths, it could be half an inch. I'd have to measure it to find out. But, uh, this one has three flutes on it or three blades. So there's actually three different cutters on there when it spins. So that leads me to my next router. Scoot this over and we'll switch cameras again. So this is my DeWalt router that I've had for, I don't know, 15 years or so. And it's been through the ringer. It's almost near the end of its life. And you can see this is a bit that has two blades only. One, two. So the new one will have three, which would be nice. It'll cut even cleaner. And it's got the bearing on there as well. And uh, this one here, you adjust the height by opening this lever and turn the, oops, sorry, open this lever, turn this wrist right, uh, this knob right here, and that will raise or lower the bit for how far it extends out. And I only want to extend enough to cut some acrylics. So for example, grab this scrap, and we can see how that would cut the edge of the acrylic perfectly. 
and the bit would be tracing something. It has to trace something, that's so important. So now we're going to try to show you what I mean with this camera up here. So here is our, boy it's right on the edge, I need to be just slightly taller. Let me grab another jig. And we can bring this down a little bit. Okay, so you can see how there's an overhang. And I'm going to try and get this angle so you can kind of, oh it's so hard to see at this perspective. Hmm, what can I do? Let's try this. We'll do it from below. Now you can see the overhang. So when the router is plugged in and running, it's going to sit on top of the project and my bearing is going to touch the acrylic wall. That's why there's blue masking tape on here. I always put blue tape on all my projects where the router is going to roll so it won't scar the acrylic. And then as I run the router, it's just going to trim off that excess and make this nice and smooth. I hope that makes sense. And I do that on all four sides of the top and then I do the same thing with the bottom. And once you've done that, it starts to look like this. Nice and smooth. See, all edged up. So now you can see the edges are rounded over as well by the smaller router bit. The excess trim was cut off all the way around. And the same goes for the bottom. It's all been uh, trimmed up. All right, it's heavy. <laughs> it's hard to do with one hand. So uh, <clears throat> that kind of gives you an idea of, you know, when you're trying to build something, you need to know where you're going, what the final approach is going to be, what you're trying to accomplish. All right, so this thing's been sitting plenty long. We can go ahead and put the other leg on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and pivot it around just because it'll make my life easier for you guys. We'll just move some things out of the way. And then I just want to move this over to here. Grab my other sheet, of, or I mean my other leg, and trim off the paper again. So you see the edge has been sanded, it's nice and smooth. And then we need to swipe it again. Now the denatured alcohol in here evaporates really quickly. So I just hit it again. I just need a little bit just to get off any oils from my flesh. It's going to go right here. I'm going to adjust the jig until it's right on my marks again. And the cool thing is when the solvent hits the marks, it kind of just melts them away. So you don't have to sit there and think you're going to have this blue or black dot or whatever color you used there forever. All right, that looks pretty good. Now I'm going to place the pins underneath again. I've been using the pin method forever. Because it works. Now if this was a longer leg, if this was like this long, I might use four pins, not just two. So I'd have one on the end, one on the other end, one here, a midpoint, and then one over here. And I'd make sure that everything's straight, and like I said, I might have to even clamp it or use the magnets to hold it together. But in this case, we're just doing another freehand. I'm gluing this left-hander for you guys. So I just run it along the edge. And that's it. We let it sit. Make sure it's still centered. Yes. And that's it. Now the glue is obviously not good for you. So if you get on your hands, it's smart to wash your hands. Um, definitely don't put your finger covered in glue in your mouth. Don't rub your eyes, nothing like that. Um, I don't wear a respirator or anything like that when I work around this. I've been working around it forever. I was working around other fumes before this, so it's like whatever. But uh, it definitely has a strong smell. And I'm sure for some people in California it would kill them because everything kills you in California. I'll switch angles one more time so you can see another spot that's gluing and you can see the pin right there. I'm trying to point. <laughs> right there. And my other pin is almost is out of the shot on the other side. Uh, another thing you can do while you're gluing, like if you're in an air-conditioned room, in this room, the vent is actually directly in front of me as I'm standing here, and it's blowing down on my project. And if that's a problem, you should temporarily close the vent so you can just not have a weird change of uh, environmental conditions while you're gluing. So I, there's times where I've done that, where I've just shut that one vent, 
applied my glue, let it sit for 10 minutes, and then I opened the vent again, so that way it's not blowing cold air across some brand new solvent. These are just those little nuances you learn to do over time. You're like, oh, this would be better if I did this. All right, that feels like about 30 seconds or so. If you pull the pins too soon, you end up with bubbles. Uh, it's like you're, you end up with a dry seam. You want to have enough time for the glue to melt the piece on top and to melt the piece it's going into because it's welding them into one. Right, switch back again. So here's our final product. And the leg on the other side is nice and rigid already. Now, when you're trying to drill holes, I'm going to jump to another topic here for a second. When you're trying to drill holes through your acrylic, I don't have the hole saws near me, I'm sorry. Those are in the workshop. But if you're going to put in like a bulkhead, for example, or a little tiny bulkhead, then you need to know the diameter of the fitting that's going through <clears throat> so that it will fit in your project. Because if you drill the wrong size hole, your life becomes exponentially more difficult as you try and correct the problem. Uh, yes, Martinez, it is a welding process. So, and then one I showed you before, I made sure that this hole was the right size for that bulkhead fitting. And I had to specially order these. They were uh, not very easy to get. And so what I used to measure the diameter was this handy dandy tool that I was told to get from a friend. So this one here has an on off button right here. And then as it rolls apart, it gives you the dimension of what size you've got. And then you would put your fitting in there and find your, your midpoint. And there's different ways of using it, but you know, this gives you the ballpark. You know, I'm just giving you a visual on, on here. If I was doing this by myself, I'm like, okay, I'll do this. I can go this way. I can go this way. You know, I'd verify from different angles and I would look at it and see what my number is. But the bottom line is that number there is 748, which would be 0.75. So I made sure my hole is 0.75. With a bulkhead, it's larger and you want to be at the midpoint. You don't want to be askew. And this is saying 1.678. So 1.7 would be the ideal hole size to slide this bulkhead through acrylic and then put the nut on and tighten it. A lot of times you'll see websites are saying use 1.75, which is a little bit bigger, which is fine. It gives you some wiggle room on that bulkhead, but it's actually a little bit too loose. I mean, just a little for me. I like it to be snug, just right, and then pop that guy in there. We don't want to force anything in. It must fit. Acrylic does not like being pushed, twisted, or forced. So when you're uh, installing anything on it, you know, you would put in your bulkhead, you're going to tighten it by hand, you don't use a wrench, and uh, you make sure you have a nice good clean seal. But uh, if you took this and you just hammered it into the acrylic, then odds are you're going to run into problems later on that you don't want to encounter. So that's important. All right. Calipers, thank you. Yeah, see, I ordered it once, I've had it three years, I never had to say his name again. I appreciate when you guys chime in with all the things that just go out of my brain. <laughs> Here's another jig that I use. So this is a larger L shape or 90 degree and it's got the magnets on there again. I got all these magnets from Ecotech. I said, can you send me all your rejects? And they sent me like 15 or 20 of these years ago. And when I put my acrylic piece here, I'll use the magnet to hold it in place. It's super handy. And I can use this jig this way or this way, which is very nice. Another jig that I have and gets used a lot is this one, which I know looks kind of goofy. So it's a work surface for like making the top down photo boxes. And I'll put the base plate here, or and actually I'll put the, the front piece here and then I put the viewing pane here and apply the glue. And then once it's cured, then I can go ahead and I can put on my end pieces, top and bottom, which I'll flip, 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 and then I put the base in place. And then it all gets routed and turned into a nice little box. But this thing gets used for a lot of different projects like that. Um, when it comes to weighting your project, like let's say for example, I had this project, it's sitting on my table, it's gluing, and I've got the needles in here. How much weight do I want on top? I mean, this thing already weighs quite a bit. This is probably eight pounds just in acrylic alone. So if I put uh, like a 10 pound weight on each side, that's 20 extra pounds, you'd actually push the solvent right out of the seam and actually make the seam weaker. So you don't want to put too much weight. If you need to use any weight at all, you put a small amount on there, just enough to kind of keep it to where the needle doesn't wiggle. 
And then the other thing you want to use under the acrylic would be a shim. So I have a whole bunch of wooden shims I made a long time ago. And for example, I'll just grab something handy. This won't be easy, but uh, let's switch to this one here. So like, let's say for example, I'm just gonna do it on this just cause it's handy. Let's say I was trying to glue this piece on here and I have my needle right here and I have my other needle over here and obviously the paper would be off. But this needle's dancing around, it won't stay. <clears throat> By putting the shim under the acrylic itself, it's lifting the acrylic up, which makes the needle touch this piece, and now I can do my bond. And then after I waited 30 seconds, I pull the pin out, so I slide it out and hopefully not move my project too much. I would take the shim and I would tap it in a little bit further in. So I just give it a little nudge to bring this material up to here. Just trying to give you an example of how the shim works out. Putting a shim under each needle is the best practice when you're doing this because each item is being supported uh, equally and you have a nice straight true line so that the entire piece is fully supported all the way across. So you've got needle, needle, needle. Plus when you're working and you're looking from above, let me switch the camera view. You can see the pin right there and you won't forget it and leave it in too long. So you've got your pins sitting on top of your shims and then after you've waited 30 seconds, you go around your big huge project and you pull out your pin, slide in your shim, pull out your pin, slide in your shim, pull out the pin, and you just work your way around until you've got, or maybe you're just doing one big long side of a sump. You're gonna be working shim to shim to shim. All right. Let's see, what else did I, uh want to tell you from my pile of stuff. Oh, let's say you don't want to make wooden, uh, wooden uh, 90 degree uh, jigs. Let's say you want to use something simpler. When you go to Home Depot or Lowe's, they sell these carpenter squares. So this one here is a, a large uh, framing square <clears throat> used a lot of times by carpenters that are doing roofing work and so forth. And so this is a great 90 degree, obviously, right? But the problem is this is sitting right in the seam and this would, your glue as you're gluing a seam would glue this right to your project. Now they do make them out of metal, but that's not the solution. The solution is to cut off the corner right at the, at a 45 degree angle. So now when you've got this piece on the sheet of acrylic, the other piece here, you have a gap right here. And as you apply the glue, there's no way the glue is going to get onto your, your uh, speed square and it won't end up uh, ruining your project. So make sure everything's trimmed off. On the other jig I showed you before, like the wooden one I used just now for the skimmer stand, I have rounded these corners, the same principle of the 45 degree I was talking about. So that way the glue cannot get under and glue my board to the acrylic. And yes, it is possible for glue to go underneath if you put too much and your block of wood will stick to it and it actually sticks to the acrylic. And then when you pull it off, there's this ugly spot that you have to spend so much time fixing. So you try to avoid that at all costs. All right. What other tools do I have over here that I use all the time? <clears throat> I have different kinds of clamps. So like this is a handy clamp to keep a piece of acrylic onto a jig. Here's a little small one for smaller projects that uses tension to hold it in place. Um, sometimes you need something to elevate your project. So I got these little spacers that are rubber on each side and they kind of keep something in the middle of a project where it cannot hang down too low. Uh, someone says, how much do you save by drilling your own tank? Uh, that's a totally different project uh, topic, but uh, yeah, you're gonna save money. <laughs> you're gonna save a lot of hassle and uh, it's not really hard to do actually. Just, I have a video showing exactly how I drilled glass a while back that you could check out. And there's plenty of them on YouTube, but yeah, you just gotta buy the bit. You need to be outside. You gotta take your time and I really recommend a cordless drill because if you've got running water and you've got an electric drill plugged into the wall, there's a chance you could get shocked and we don't want that to happen. So be sure that you are using a cordless drill is smarter. The drill has to be able to run at a steady speed for about five minutes. So, because it takes about that long to cut through glass. With acrylic, cutting the same size hole would take about 40 seconds. It's much quicker. You don't have to force it. The bit will just cut right through it and you'll have a nice clean hole. And then if you want, you can route the edge to make it smoother. You can sand it with a little bit of sandpaper and uh, just kind of take away the burrs. And then you can install your bulkhead with no issue whatsoever.
All right. Um, let me see what else is on my cart. Okay, so the bottle itself needs to be filled up. And usually, like the can of Weldon, which is one of the most popular solvents out there for gluing acrylic together, Weldon comes in, a, you know, with a large mouth on it, and it's hard to move the solvent from that into the neck of a smaller bottle, especially if the bottle gets even smaller. But this is the neck of the bottle. It's pretty narrow, and so if we're trying to fill this up, we need something that would be ideal. So I found the most adorable funnel ever. And that works really nicely for me. I keep stepping on my microphone cord. Um, so when I'm filling up the bottle, if I pour in liquid in here, it actually will fill up the funnel too fast to where, uh, because it's creating a seal, <laughs> so air can't get out. So if you can kind of hold your fingers underneath just slightly to lift it up a little bit, it'll pour in pretty rapidly. You know, it's just one of those little helpful tips that might come in handy for you. And then of course, screw on your lid nice and tight again. Make sure it's not gonna come off. And then you make sure your needle is nice and secure too. You don't want that to pop off. And if it was gonna come off or it's at risk, I would just get rid of the bottle and get a fresh one, like I showed you. And then when you're done using it, you can either you could put the solvent back in with a rest, or you can just put the lid on top, and that'll keep it from evaporating away. But it seems to hold it pretty well in these bottles. Um, another trick that I use is a magnet with a utility blade. And I use this thing all the time. So when I need to Let's move some stuff. Let me switch this around for you. When I need to glue something, take for example this piece right here. And this, remember I told you it's tedious peeling off this paper. So I start it and then I peel it back, but I'm not gonna remove it entirely because I wanna leave the rest of it safe from getting marred during the process. So I'll fold it over like this, and now that part is exposed. And then because of my little holder, I can take my razor blade and I can just slice it like this and remove my paper, go to the other side, do the exact same thing. And I do this with all my projects. I spend a lot of time peeling paper. And then I got a trick for you guys for if you're removing a big piece of paper, I'm gonna tell you in a second. So now you saw I've got this piece ready. I apply my uh, denatured alcohol. I swipe my edge here and here. I would take my project piece. I'd remove the paper. I put my first piece in place with a jig and I can glue it. And the glue will not be able to touch the paper because the glue is way down here. So you, this thing is so handy for trimming off the extra paper. And you could try to do it by hand and just kind of take your fingers and just slide it. But having this little magnet I have, I've had this forever. It's just one of those things that, you know, it comes with your aquarium and you just never get rid of. <laughs> Came into a nice little handle. Now, I will tell you, I have been sliced open by this as it jumped off the table when I moved something with metal and I was carrying it across and the thing came up and just slashed my thumb open last year and I was in the ER. So whenever you're done, take the magnet off and put the magnet away. The blade's not gonna jump off the table and get you. But if the magnet's attached to it, there's a risk you'll get zinged. And I've, I've been hit a few times, which is annoying. And I don't recommend it. Um, you can also use a small ruler when you're measuring instead of a tape measure, if it's more convenient for you. So like, for example, let's say we're putting this first piece on. And I'm gonna use that razor blade without the magnet. So you see, it was a little bit harder. And then we've got our piece here that we're gonna put on. And we grab our little tray in, my little jig. And this time we didn't put any marks on there. So I'm gonna just put this in place where I think it's gonna go. And then I can use my ruler that's made of plastic and just set it there and see if I'm at an eighth of an inch. Cause I basically want an eighth of an inch overhang on my piece. And once I've got that, I can go ahead and put my weight in place, put my two needles in place, and I can go ahead and glue this piece on. So there you go, um, answered that one. I feel like there's so much I'm not mentioning. <laughs> okay, what if you have to fix a problem? This is weld on number 16, and uh, this is 16 rod right there. And uh, you know, yeah, looks. I guess it's right. Um, 
when you try to apply this, again, remember the, the uh, solvent is a needle nose applicator, but number 16 comes with a much larger orifice and it really goops out. So I'd like to control how much comes out. So I went to the store. I was like, where are they? I see them, they're under everything. Um, it's my last one. And I found these glue applicator tips and I took my tube with me to the store to make sure this was gonna fit. And it fits right on there perfectly. You can just wedge it nice and tight. And you can trim this to whatever thickness you want for how large you'd like the opening to be. I like it to be very fine, so I would actually, you know, this is way too thin, that's pointless. I would cut it off right about there. And that way, when I put this into the tank and I'm running along the inside of a seam that I'm trying to mend, I'm limiting how much comes out. Because Well Done 16, as it dries, if you, uh, well, as it dries, it shrinks by a third. And if you use a whole bunch and you're like just glopping it on there because you're thinking, I'm gonna fix this, it's never gonna leak again. What it'll do is as it shrinks, it sucks in all these air bubbles and it looks totally hideous. So by just using the right amount of number 16 solvent, you can get a nice clean fillet inside the seam that doesn't look hideous. But if you, you know, so don't use it like caulk. That's the number one rule with number 16. You just use just enough. And then if you want, you can wait, you know, and it's like eight hours later or so, and you want to apply another thin bead over that to make another thin strata. You can do that too, I guess. I've never done it, but I mean, I guess you could. The, uh, but the point is, this is not, I mean, number, never ever say to yourself, like caulk, it's not. And uh, it'll just make everything hideous and you'll be unhappy. So don't do that. That I don't recommend. But having a tip is really important. You, they don't come together. <laughs> you gotta go find these. I found this one at Hobby Lobby and it was like a five pack for no, two sixty nine. Thought it was 99 cents, but it cost me more. Whatever. Um, I think that's mostly it, guys. I mean, I'm sure there's a, a ton of other things that I could get into about dynamics, but like, okay, when you're working on a table saw to cut out your pieces, which is probably what many of you are gonna do, and you've got to push it through, it would be really good if you put a platform on the other side on the receiving end where the sheet is coming off to support it. Uh, for a long time, you know, I would just like, eh, I'll just, I'll use my muscle and I'll push it through and hold it, but it's, you know, flopping at the other end. And quarter inch acrylic is very bendy and eighth inch is even worse. I don't even use eighth inch, I've never used eighth inch. I mean, just the very first project, learning how to use acrylic, I bought eighth inch because I didn't know better. And as soon as I used it, I knew never to use it again. And I never own any. <laughs> it's been quarter inch for, I don't know, 17, 18 years. So uh, I use quarter inch or like I said, three eighths. And if you're working with a big sheet, like a four foot by eight foot sheet, which you may be doing, it might be better to set it up on saw horses, like a big sheet of plywood, and take a circular saw with a fine tooth blade with like 80 teeth or more and cut it down to get it bite size. So now you can put the bite size piece on the table for a precision cut. And that way you don't risk having the whole sheet jam on the blade and bind or kick back at you or come off the other end and get damaged. So uh, I remember there was times where I'd have my son help me and I'd say, I need you on the other side. And I would tell him, look, when it comes out the other end, I just want you to put your hands under it and I just want you to lift and back up. And that's all I want you to do, just back up. Don't grab it, don't lift it, don't turn it. Just move backwards with me. And he did for a long time uh, when we had those big projects. For the smaller stuff, I was able to do it myself. And by putting a platform on the other side, it was really easy to just push things through because it was fully supported at the other end. And that's basically, you're gonna make something that's temporary because you're probably not gonna keep your table saw running like that all the time. So you have your saw, you pull it out, you put your little platform on the other side, you run your sheet through there, and you put everything away again. And uh, then you need to edge it. And there are some tools that are sold on the market to edge acrylic, which is kind of a scraper you drag with a couple of handles and you pull it towards you. Couldn't stand those, I never liked that. And uh, so I made myself, I think I still own it. Cause you know, I never throw anything away. Yep, I still do. So I made myself this little gizmo right here. <laughs> it's two pieces of half inch, uh, no quarter inch plywood. And then right here is a utility knife blade that I embedded in there. And the blue tape basically gave me a visual where the blade was and I could scrape it across my acrylic and it makes a horrible sound. It's like, 
And uh, my son was like, oh. so I always did it when I was alone. But <laughs> this was the way I did it. You could just loosen the screws, pull out the blade, put a new blade in, and that was it. But then, like I said, I got sick of doing this really quick. And I got the uh, bench jointer where I can slide the sheet across a blade that's spinning at 10,000 RPMs. And those uh, bench jointers are about 200 bucks. Table saws range in price from a cheap Black & Decker for $99 up to maybe five, six, eight hundred, or you can go crazy and spend 2,500 or more for a really nice one. Uh, it really comes down to what you want to use. And in the link that I mentioned is in the video description, it shows a picture of the blade that I recommend for the table saw which should be marked ATB, which is alternate tooth blade, and the uh, the teeth are, are alternate tooth bevel. And so instead of the teeth just being in a row and just chopping through, one's cutting this way, one's cutting this way, one's cutting this way, and they're, it works its way through. And the inside of the blade, or the metal, the main part, the disc, is thinner than the teeth sticking out. So as you push it through, the the core, the blade itself, can't heat up the acrylic and melt it. So you've got this alternate tooth bevel chopping through, leaving a nice curve line, and you can move the acrylic straight across and uh, not mar the edge or melt the edge down. If you, uh, some people have access to laser cutters and they say, oh, I'll get all my acrylic laser cut. That's actually not good. A laser cutter melts the edge, and once the edge is melted, you can't glue it to something else. So that's why the table saw is the, the more likely approach. The other choice would be to take your acrylic and put it down on a, on a surface, like a big work table, workbench, with a nice straight true edge and overhang just, in, you know, let's say you want your piece to be 16 and a half inches wide and 48 inches long. And so you cut it on a table saw 16 and three quarter inches and now you have a quarter inch extra that's hanging over. You could put that on your straight edge table and you could take your router and you could just route the edge and get a nice perfect clean edge but everything has to be dead, straight, flat, no nicks or dings, because you want a perfect edge, the full length for the 48 inches. And if there's some kind of little sway or bevel in there or, or bow, it affects the glue joint. And we want our glue joints to look nice and clear and you see through them. You don't want them to be white. You don't want them to be cloudy. You, uh, if, and you know, so a lot of times I tell people, practice on something small. Don't sit there and say, I want to make my own tank and you've never made one before. That's the worst way to do it. You want to make something small, learn from those little tiny itty bitty mis uh, mistakes that don't cost a lot. And then when you're comfortable and you see how things work and you can see how your environment works and how your workbench worked out and if the tools cooperate and if the router bit played nicely, if you can do all of that, then you can take on the bigger project. But I I've seen some people do some massive stuff and get really lucky and it all worked out. It wasn't pretty, but it did the job. <laughs> and that's okay too. So, you know, it, what do they say? Perfection is the enemy of progress. So, you know, you know, if you want perfect, you usually go to a professional and have them do it. Um, if you want to just do a really good job, you know, learn as much as you can through YouTube and reading articles and uh, reading books. <laughs> books, those are a thing, right? And you can get some knowledge that way to actually tackle this project. But uh, other than that, uh, it's really just a matter of doing it over and over. And uh, I talked to someone recently, and he said he had all these bubbles, and I explained to him, well, you know, how long did you wait before you pulled the pins, for example? And he was like, ah, that, that was the problem. And you see, there's different uh, cure rates with different solvents. So like Weld on 3 is faster, Weld on 4 is slower, Weld on 42 is a two-part combination that gives you a little bit more of a, uh, a breather be before you have to pull the pins. I uh, had the opportunity to go to Next Reef years ago. Uh, man, I think it was four years ago now. And they were gluing together a big beefy tank for a puffer fish that was David's favorite pet. And he was making this, this was like I think a three foot by three foot by three foot cube using two inch acrylic. Unbelievable. The cost alone of making that tank out of, just the acrylic alone was so high. And he said, hey, you're here, you can help glue this seam. I'm like, absolutely not. That one piece of acrylic is probably $1,000. You know, I was like, I'm not touching it. And he goes, no, no, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. And he had the 42, which what he had, you know, because normally you have this can and you have this little bottle and you put it into a, a special plastic cup that nothing glues to and you add the little bit and you stir it and then you put it inside a vacuum chamber and it will suck the air right out of the solvent. So the solvent is just, it's just pure solvent there's nothing in it it's it's amazing 
Um, I got to see that when I went to Titan Aquatics. I watched the guy suck the air out of the glue, and it was really, really neat. <laughs> so, uh, but what they did after they, he had this thing that looked like a caulk gun that had this nozzle on the end that had a curly Q plastic thing inside. And so the two parts would just go in and they would curly Q, and by the, the time they came out the other the tip, they were ready. But even then, we didn't just use the caulk gun and glue together this tank. He had two people with the curly Q guns standing over a big trash can. And then he had these small applicator bottles, like, you know, sort of like bigger than what we use for test kits, but the same principle, that had this curled tip on the end, and they were disposables. And so he would hold the tube open, the person would shoot their caulk gun into it to fill it up, he'd put the plunger in, and he would hand it to the next person, and that person starts putting the glue while the next tube's being filled up, and that got handed to that person, and then that one got... And it was like this, systematically, working their way across the seam. And so they gave me a couple of these things, and I'm working from the other end. And so, uh, I can't remember who I was working with, but, you know, the thing was three feet long, so he started on this end, I started on this end, and we worked our way toward each other, you know, tube after tube after tube as we got to the center, and then we hit it, and the needles were ginormous. They were like... I don't know, maybe for sewing carpets together, they were thick. I mean, they were, they were probably almost an eighth inch thick because this is a huge, heavy piece of acrylic. And they'd put those needles in advance. We put in our solvent. We only got the solvent halfway, which was really weird to me. He says, yeah, you're not gonna get it to the other side like you do with your seams because you're used to quarter inch. We're going two inches. You're gonna get solvent one inch. That's all you gotta do. I'm like, all right. So I was doing my job. And then he came over with pliers after we waited, and I can't remember, it feels like a couple of minutes. He came with these pliers, and he grabbed the needle, and he pulls with all his strength, and, you know, he had the giant block of acrylic. Uh, it was clamped with these giant jigs so it couldn't move, and he pulled out that one, and the thing goes, kunk. And then he went to the next one and pulled it, and then he pulled the third one, and then he pulled the fourth one, and the whole thing came down, and the solvent just went completely through. It was amazing. I was like, oh, that was so neat. And so the guy that, you know, was working next to me, he's been doing it for years. He was really good at it. Like I said, I've never glued anything that expensive or that thick in my life. And he said, oh, you have three tiny bubbles. You totally fail, Mark. And, you know, he was right. I mean, his was perfect. And I had three little microscopic bubbles. They were nothing to worry about. They, they didn't even make an eyesore, but we could see them. And, uh, you know, it was in a piece of acrylic that was... That was the seam. <laughs> so uh, three little pinpoints weren't going to do anything. But it was a neat thing to do. I never wanted to do it again. It was terrifying because I kept thinking about how much it was worth. And I just didn't want to take responsibility for that kind of money. And so they built this thing. It was beautiful. Guess what? It wouldn't fit through the doorway to get into the waiting area where they were going to set up the tank because the tank was three feet by three feet by three feet and the doorway was less. So they ended up having to remove like an entire window or something on the front in the storefront to bring the tank inside uh, later on. It was like, oops. So, you know, make sure your project will fit through the door that you're building. That's another handy tip when it comes to working with acrylic. All right. Um, if you route the, uh, so one person just said, if you route the edges, is that perfectly fine? You don't have to sand it then. Yeah, it, actually sanding's not a great thing. So I'll try and give you a bad demonstration here. Here's a piece of acrylic, and let's just pretend it was even clamped. And I put my, my sanding block on there. This is solid. It's not, you know, like a soft sponge. So this is very, very stiff and straight and, you know, coarse. And this is around, I think, 200 grit. It, even as I do it with my hand and I'm going across it and I'm sliding back and forth, there is that tendency to teeter-totter a little bit. And you end up rounding over your edges just a little bit. And you don't want to round over anything. You want this thing to be totally uh, true and straight. Super important. So... You know, you could try putting it down like this and pull the piece across. But again, if you rock it, you know. So sanding's not usually the desire. You just want a very perfect, clean edge. And so I uh, have a belt sander out there. It's a tabletop belt sander. And for the small piece like this, I just hold it on for about... I hold it... So here's my belt that's running at whatever RPMs that is. I don't just put it on there like this. I actually run at an angle and I just kind of like let it slide, like ski across the sandpaper and then I check it. And if it looks good, I go to the next one. And I can do each one in about 10 seconds, which is super convenient compared to what I'd been doing in the past. But if you have a perfectly routed edge, no imperfections whatsoever, you don't have to do anything. It's ready to glue. All right. Um, now, 
So I've been talking about acrylic the whole time. I didn't mention polycarbonate. And someone mentioned that. I don't know if they're answering a question or, or asking something or chatting with themselves. But polycarbonate is different from acrylic. It cuts differently. Um, it glues differently. And I use it for all my projects for lids. And so like the top off containers have a lid. The dosing containers will have lids. You can just take off and pour in more solution and put the lid back on. Uh, the overflow boxes, I make a polycarbonate lid that sits on top that lets you put an auto feeder if you wanted. It lets, it keeps algae from growing in the overflow box and it prevents fish from jumping in there because there's a lid in the way. And polycarbonate doesn't warp. It stays straight forever, which is great. Where if you'd put a piece of acrylic on top of the overflow box, it's humid underneath and it's dry on top probably because you're lighting or just ambient air. And so it curls because of the moisture. So you take the lid and you, you rinse it off in the sink and you flip it over and it's curved like this and then it finally flattens out and then it curls the other way again. And you find yourself every week flipping the lid right over, 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 over because it's acrylic. So if you use polycarbonate, polycarbonate stays straight because it doesn't absorb the moisture. Acrylic has this uh, ability to absorb a certain percentage. I think it's like 3% or so of moisture, which is just enough to make the darn thing curve, which looks bad. And it just is an eyesore. So that's why uh, if you get a, some kind of a screen top with an acrylic frame, you might notice it's doing this weird bow. It's because it's made of acrylic. But if they could make the screen top with polycarbonate, it should stay nice and straight and rigid and beautiful forever, which is what we, you know, we like things to last that way. Um... All right, let me scroll up and see the hundred questions I've missed so far, because I think I've kind of covered all the things I want to talk about. Let me just double check here. Uh, Mark says, I am going to drill my acrylic tank. It's three quarters of an inch thick. Uh, the hole saws are in that link in the article at the very bottom. If you scroll all the way to the bottom of that article, it shows the kind I use. They are a type of, uh, it uses an arbor that lets you change the actual hole saw to whatever size you need. And uh, those work really, really well. You can, as you're drilling through, you don't have to do it all in one run if you don't want to. You could start it and then you could, you know, remove the bit, you know, you know take the drill out and hit it with an air compressor, blow out some shavings and then continue and work your way through. And, you know, but that three quarters of an inch, you probably go through that in probably a minute or so. You don't have to oil it. You don't have to add water or anything like that. I mean, you could put some kind of an oil if you wanted, but normally we just don't. We just work our way through. And I like to just blow out the shavings and then go back in and continue some more until I've gone all the way through. And then you have to get the uh, chunk of acrylic out of your hole saw, <laughs> which is uh, another thing I did. So I took a broom handle and I drilled a, a hole in the end of the broom handle and I put in some kind of a... It was some kind of a punch, and I embedded it in that stick. And then whenever I had a hole saw that had a piece of acrylic in it, I would just take the hole saw, and you know the punch was standing straight up, and I would just bring it down two or three times, and bloop, it would pop the piece out. So that was my trick for getting those out. Page not found, so that link didn't work. Well, we will fix that. Um, I'll do that later. But um, okay, so if you go to milosreef.com, and then click on articles, then on the right side of the screen, if you're using a browser, like a, you know, a computer, I mean, then you'll see uh, the different topics and click on acrylics and tools I use as the article. Uh, Smoking Reefer says, can you deliver the working trays to the UK? Yeah, those, uh, the work tray can be shipped. It's not a problem. It's not that big. It's not that heavy. So it shouldn't be too expensive to ship. Yeah, I know. I need a haircut. <laughs> Let's see. Yay! Sean says I inspired him to take the jump into reef tanks. Ha <laughs> ha! I fooled another one, guys. I did it. Let's see. Um, Michael, if you can send me your postal code, I can do a shipping quote and find out what it's going to cost. I got it. It's what it comes down to is the the dimensions of the box, the weight of the box, and the value of the product inside. That's what they give me the shipping price. I don't know it by heart. Um, ben said, "How do you sand edges without accidentally rounding the ends? It's really hard. It's something you. It's sort of like a muscle memory thing. You just learn how to do it." Um, but if you mess up, 
your option is to basically put it through a table saw again and trim off, you know, a sixteenth of an inch and start again. Uh, so your project may become a little bit shorter, but now if one piece becomes a little bit shorter, you have to make all the other ones the same height as well. Total pain, right? Because you have to go redo. But uh, so your entire project ends up being a sixteenth less tall than it was originally. But that, or it might be a little bit less wide than what you'd planned on initially. Uh, but yeah, everything has to match up. There's no give and take. You can't have something a little bit bigger and a little bit smaller. It, it just won't come together correctly. Everything's got, it's going to be like Lego blocks. Everything has to be the exact same size so it snaps together perfectly. Uh, Afonso says, do you think 8 millimeter acrylic would uh, be enough for a 60 centimeter sump with baffles? I'm going to just guess no. That sounds like you're, that sounds like maybe it's eighth inch, which is too thin. And uh, I'd like to go, I'm just, quarter inch, quarter inch, everything's quarter inch. What, whatever that is. Is that eight millimeters? I don't know. Someone tell me. Um, and yeah, Sean... Can weld on 16 be used to fill gaps? Yes, it's good for little tiny gaps. It's not good for some giant crater. Um, another thing you can do, of course I don't have one thing handy here that I usually have things all over my table ready to grab, but like for example, man, I wish I had one. Yeah, I got nothing here. I've put everything away for once in my life. Let's say I have a little gap right here, just a bad spot. I could take a very small piece of acrylic, like a little skinny sliver of a stick, and I could put 16 there, and then I could put the little stick in that spot. And it's not going to be pretty, but it's going to seal it. And that is a good way to reinforce like the bottom of an aquarium that you had to fix. So rather than just putting glue and hoping that it's going to hold you know, all the water pressure back, by putting in something you know, like, let's say it's a quarter inch by quarter inch by three inches long, and you bond it right in there, it's this ugly little stick, and the, the, uh, the number 16 melts it all into the rest of this, it becomes nice and strong. And you know, if you have a sand bed, it's gonna hide most of it, and then you have trim on the outside of the tank, and so it's invisible too. But you'll know it's there. I mean, it's always gonna be there forever. But I've done that with a few projects where somebody had me fix something, and I went in and I went ahead and I, I glued in this french fry <laughs> against the bad spot. And you can choose how big the piece needs to be. It doesn't have to be a certain amount, but uh, you know, I like to cover the entire area. So like, let's say my gap is a uh, one inch long. I might put like a, a total of a two inch piece on there. Uh, that's the shape of a french fry and just pop it in there so it's got nice reinforcement. Uh, Eric, that is not your skimmer stand. But this one will be. <laughs> the one I just demoed was uh, my tank setter skimmer stand. Uh, Spike says, is plexiglass from Home Depot the same as acrylic? Yes, plexiglass is a name of a brand. And then Sean asked something very specific that I'm, I'm not aware of, but he says, does laser, laser cutting affect the acrylic? So laser cutting is melting the acrylic as it cuts and it gives you that beautiful, nice, shiny edge, but it's bad for gluing, and so you have to sand away the shine to get down to the bare material again so you can glue it to another piece. Uh, like, for example, all the stuff that the Clarisy is made out of, the Clarisy fleece roller, that's all been cut with a laser cutter, and it, all of it gets uh, pressed together and screwed together with, uh, what do you call it? Uh, thumb screws and uh, you screw it all together, there's no glue involved. So it can be completely laser cut and uh, be assembled without any, any issue at all. But if you had to glue that thing together and make it into one piece, all the edges have to be sanded down. Uh, Odile says, contact an acupuncture doctor, but he could get you what you need. I actually did, that's what I did. I asked an acupuncturist, I said, I need this exact needle. And then it took, you know, I don't know, a month. And when we finally got them, they were much, much too thin and worthless. I mean, it was like a waste of time. So I'm just glad I have what I have. And yes, D is correct. Don't knock the weight off and crack the sump bottom. You, you heard my story from last week, apparently. That was so bad. <laughs> I was so mad at him. Uh, insane Reefer, the uh, dosing containers are different kinds on my website, so just take a look there for some pricing ideas. 
And then Ben says, so you purposely incorporate an overhang so you can router it to the correct dimension. Yes, if my project is going to be 12 inches long and 8 inches wide, I'm going to make the bottom piece and the top piece 12 and a quarter by 8 and a quarter. And that gives me an eighth of an inch all the way around that I'm going to route off to get a nice, clean, perfect edge. Because you just can't glue a piece to the edge and make it look good. It'll look okay. You could work some magic, but it's probably going to have some hideousness somewhere in there. But by working it slightly inside the project, you get that beautiful seam and then you route off that excess and it looks like you made a perfect seam. And that's what you want. You want it to look perfect. And then uh, if you want to avoid it being sharp to the touch, which it is, then use the roundover bit to give it that slight curve. And that was something that uh, Dave told me to do too. He says, you need to start routing all the edges. I'm like, no, I just route the top because that's what they touch. And he's like, yeah, but they got to carry it into their house. And like I put it under their tank. You don't want to get cut. And I was like, oh. So I started rounding over everything I sell now. And, uh, and it actually makes everything look nicer. It's more work for me. It didn't make me any more money. But uh, it ends up being a really nice way to do it. Let's see. Uh, Tia Tell says, how long do your router bits last me? And I wanted to show you guys the router bit that Minion uses. It's completely different. But uh, it looks like a candy cane. <laughs> it's a spiral cut bit, has no bearing on it because there's this giant machine on top that controls it at all times. And uh, these bits probably last me, I'd say about three months, depending how intensive it is. It really, it's sort of like, I feel like new bits and I just change them. It's never been, oh man, this bit is so bad, I gotta change it. But uh, it seems like I used, well, I'm sure it is. I used to use a lot more bits before I got Minion. Now Minion uh, runs with a specific bit that cuts out everything, and then I'm just doing cleanup with these guys. And so they last a lot longer than they used to, I guess. And uh, the one on Minion probably lasts me. It's interesting. So you have, you know, when you start working with an industrial machine, which this thing is, I mean, it's, it's going to outlive me forever. <laughs> um, as it cuts through the acrylic, you know, it leaves a kerf, which is the cut line, and it shavings come out and they're vacuumed away as it's cutting. And the, uh, I, when I first bought the machine, I was told, you know, you need to take the shavings and just kind of like rub them in your finger and see what they feel like. And I kind of forgot, you know, that they were supposed to be fine like dust. Mine was being more like snow. It was kind of clumped together. And that should have been my, hey, you need to replace the bit. And I replaced the bit recently because I was doing things. And, uh, I was like, oh man, I totally forgot. I want to have super fine, dusty snow coming off. So uh, a nice sharp bit does a great job. It's really easy to get cut by that bit if you're you know, working around it, like adjusting the height or swapping out something. I mean, you have to be careful with those bits. They're super sharp. These aren't quite as, as scary to handle, um, but those definitely are razor sharp, especially brand new out of the package. And I buy them online. And uh, these bits here probably cost around... 24 26 dollars a piece maybe you might get them as low as 19. i really like these um there's others that are cheaper that really don't last for a little while there i thought oh man i can buy this awesome little kit at home depot and they're all blue they had like nine different ones inside this box and i tried you know the bit i needed i had all these other bits i was probably never going to use but thought they might come in handy one day and i did like one project and the bit was done i was like oh, i'll never buy these again so i focus on what i'm going to actually use and these Freud bits are really, really good. Um, they're very durable. They're very precise. They have never let me down. And so I, I do like them. If you don't want to use a straight bit and you want to use a spiral cut, you can. The benefit of a spiral cut bit, and it's going to cost more. It might be $10, $12 more than this bit. But because it's a spiral, as it's spinning and cutting, the shavings are going up the bit and out into the air versus this one, as it's cutting straight, it's sending the shavings ahead and you're traveling and you're throwing shavings at you're kind of bumping over the shavings. So if you want to use a spiral cut bit, you can. They are harder to get sharpened if you can find anyone to sharpen them at all, but they're really durable. And like I said, they cost more. I did one one time. And the bigger this bit is, the less hot it'll get. And so for one summer, I went with a one inch bit, you know, really wide, thinking, okay, it's gonna be making these huge revolutions. It's not gonna heat up the acrylic and it's gonna give me a nice clean edge but I just didn't like using it. It was just too big. It was just like running a beer can down the side of a sump. So I went back to these and uh, they're very, very good bits. So I do like that. The ones on Minion, I'd say I'm probably replacing those 
uh, every couple of months, unless I break one, which happens too. Sometimes I make a mistake and it takes one second, snap, you're like, oh, there went whatever that was, $28. <laughs> so that's the downside. Uh, Coral Lover says, how long do you want to wait for glue to cure? 10 to 15 minutes is um, usually acceptable for like what we just did, the skimmer stand. Um, and then I still set it aside to cure, but I mean, now I can kind of move it around and get it out of my way. But uh, like with a sump I'm working on, I wait at least 30 minutes before I make any changes. And then, uh, like for example, I have my big sheet on the table and I glue my end on, I glue the other end on, then I put in my refugium baffle and I put in my triple baffles and that sits for at least 30 minutes, maybe even an hour, possibly overnight. And then the next day, I will put a new sheet of acrylic, which is the front, on the table, and I'll take that project and turn it upside down, and now I can glue all those pieces on to that piece. And then that has to sit for multiple hours, or maybe even overnight. I really like to give it time to cure. I don't like to rush those kind of things because they have to last forever, so, so to speak. And then once all of it's been glued into a rectangle, like uh, I was showing you guys this project, here's a rectangle. Um, once this was completely glued, then I routed off my edges and I rounded it over. And then now I've, so let, let's just pretend this is the sump. And I've already rounded off and cut off the edges so they're clean and, and smooth. Now I can glue on the top on the sump and I can glue the bottom on the sump. So that's the order I go in. Um, and it works really well. Uh, Martina says, it's not glue, it's solvent. I know. Sometimes I'm going to use a different word just for convenience sake. Um, saying the word solvent 10,000 times is going to drive me crazy. Uh, you can use a stepper bit, or like you, maybe you said a tapper bit, to drill holes. So this one here is an example of one that starts at a quarter inch and goes all the way up to half inch. So the further you go into the material, the larger the hole becomes. And these are really nice at drilling straight holes through acrylic and uh, not binding and catching and chipping. So I really like these, and they come in different styles. Um, and it's nicer than just using a straight regular bit. I've done both. But I, ever since I started using the stepper bit, I've just stayed with those. Wow. Uh, Marcus says, my friend found a 12 foot acrylic tube on, on the junk this week. He's just giving it to me, quarter inch wall, uh, five inches in diameter. What do you think it's worth? I don't know what it's worth. I don't, I don't do anything round. How would I know? Usually when it comes to that type of acrylic, it's sold by the foot. So, you know, let's say it's $15 a foot, you know, then you've got 12 feet long. <laughs> There's your, your value, possibly. Uh, Phil says, do you have any ketomorpha for sale? I don't sell algae. I don't sell anything alive. Mm. Adam Howard says, I'm building a sump. I'm looking for options for baffles besides glass. Would acrylic adhere to the silicone to the glass tank? Glass cutting scares me, I'm not going to lie. Um, you can either have a glass company cut out your glass baffles, and then you can just silicone those in which is nice. If you do it, you tell them exactly what size you want and you tell them to polish all the edges. And the reason you're polishing all the edges is so when you're installing it and you're putting in the silicone, you don't slice your finger open running the bead against a rough edge of glass. So you pay the extra five or $10 that they charge to polish all edges and now it's nice and safe and you can handle it without, without fear and put your silicone. It is the strongest way of doing it and the glass needs to be at least a quarter inch thick. Do not use window pane glass, which is an eighth inch. It's too thin. As the water pressure hits it, it will just crack and you have to redo your work. Now you asked, can acrylic be used? Absolutely. I sell acrylic baffle kits that um, I cut specifically to fit everyone's aquarium. And so on my website, it states categorically and everyone ignores it. And I have to send them an email. Please measure the inside of your tank with your own tape measure and give me that measurement. And that way I know exactly how wide your tank is and I will cut the baffles an eighth of an inch less than your number so that way these baffles go in, and even as they absorb water and get a little bit bigger, they don't have the ability to crack your tank and ruin your sump. So uh, yes, I do sell acrylic baffles, and people silicone them in, and they do a, a, a perfectly good job.
let's uh, change up our background. While I'm looking at questions here. Uh, ben M says, how do you fix the ugly spots? If you mess up a spot on your acrylic, you can scrape it with a razor blade and you're basically going to ruin the surface. It's going to look all scored up, you know, or uh, scuffed. And then you can use different grades of sandpaper from like 150 grit all the way up to like 6,000 grit, which is super fine, smooth, feels like leather. And you work your way with, with moisture, with water, and you keep sanding. So you'll sand one direction and then you get the next grit up and you'll sand the other direction and then you'll get the next grit and you'll sand one direction again and you do this hand sanding back and forth. It's awful. I have a very old sanding kit that I use occasionally that is an acrylic uh, aquarium sanding kit and it comes with a little tiny sanding block and then it has all these different grades of sandpaper and each one's a different strength or grit. And so what I did for my own ease of mind is I marked them. So like the back of this one says number four, three, one, they're all out of order, two, five, and six. And I would go from one all the way to six. And by then you've polished out everything you can and it starts to look nice again. And But the problem is it's still, I'm not good at fixing bad acrylic. I never have been. That's why I always work with brand new acrylic. Um, I would love to actually get better at that and learn how to polish out uh, disasters and there are people that have the buffing tools and they will go in and they will just polish the heck out of it. If you used to watch the show Tanked, those guys oftentimes had a big, it looked like a grind, an angle grinder with a huge bonnet on there and they were polishing the entire tank and they'd look for any flaws and they'd take a sharpie, they'd sharpie around the flaw, then someone would sand and scrape and then they'd come in with that thing and they'd polish it all until it looked perfect. But if you got down the side of the acrylic, you'd actually see where they buffed out. I mean, you'd have to really be anal to notice it. But yeah, I mean, they're hollowing out a little bit to get rid of the imperfection. So uh, if you end up messing up your acrylic somehow, if you have a drip on there or something like that, you have to sand it out. It's one of the reasons why I don't do display tanks. And I focus instead on doing uh, 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 sumps and things that are underneath. They're not quite as critical. I still try to make them look perfect. But, you know, if there's a small flaw, it's in the sump, in the cabinet, out of sight. It's going to be full of water. It's going to get dirty over time. But a display tank has to be perfect forever. We are way, way picky when it comes to that. Uh, Josh says, what advice would you give for suction cupping live rock to an aquarium's back glass? It's probably not going to hold. It's probably not going to hold very long at all. It might seem to be okay initially, but it's just going to plop off at some point. Uh, there are companies out there that actually make uh, fake rock with a magnet embedded in it, and then you put a magnet on the backside of the tank and you hold that thing in place on your tank. And the beauty of it is you can move it somewhere else later on. You can move it up a little higher, move it down a little bit lower, shift it over because you weren't quite happy with its spot. And uh, so that would be what I'd recommend. But we just, in saltwater tanks, we don't use suction cups because they never, ever hold up long term. They just don't. Even a power head falls off the glass. You know, the thermometer pops off the glass. You know, the, the suction cup gets more brittle in salt water. It lets go. You can press it on as many times as you want. It just keeps popping off. So it's just not recommended. Looking for another question. Uh, Adam says, I've seen Corian used as well as around a refugium to prevent light escaping the rest of the sump. You know, really, the, the problem with light is not what's happening down in the sump, it's what's happening in the air. So if you have a light fixture hanging over the sump and it's shining down, that light is what grows algae elsewhere. It's not what hit down inside, because once the light gets in the sump, it ricochets off the walls and stays where it belongs. It's not shining through and hitting the rest of your sump. 
So you need to shield the top with some kind of a lampshade made of something. I like to use black foam. You can buy these big sheets of it for like 99 cents, the size of a placemat. It's thin, you can cut it with scissors. You can secure it any way you want. I took mine with a hot glue gun and a strip of acrylic and I made a curtain basically. And I mounted that foam on there and I used fishing line and I hung it between my two areas. Boom, problem solved. And it didn't cost hardly anything at all. Uh, Jeff says, I heard acrylic tanks can yellow as they age. They need polishing years down the road. Um, I would say that's not common. It's possible that yellowing happens with tanks that sat out, sat out in the sun. Now, if you own anything made of acrylic, it should never be sitting in the backyard. Even if it's used and you're done with it, it's just getting wrecked in the sunlight. The UV, all that, it's just doing a, a real number on it, on the seams, on everything. So... Uh, we want to keep whatever, if you're saving something that was made of acrylic, like a tank or a sump, put it in a room that maintains a stable temperature. Clean it really well so you don't have a smell because it's used and uh, put it in the guest room or put it in, you know, your, your uh, hobby room. But don't leave it in the garage to cook. Don't leave it in the sunlight, you know, unless you just don't care. But yellowing is very uncommon. If anything, it could even be the, a cause from the material that was used. Um, because I know a lot of people with very old acrylic tanks don't look yellow at all. And the yellowing you don't hear about very often. So I think that's a weird myth. Uh, Sean says polycarbonate yellows when exposed to UV also, right? I don't know. I haven't heard that. And uh, I use black polycarbonate where the lights are. And uh, then the top of my dosing containers and my uh, top of containers those aren't exposed to light anyway. They're inside cabinets, so they're off to the side, and uh, they just stay clear. I haven't heard anyone say anything about different colors. Macy's Daddy says, this is interesting and makes me appreciate the acrylic products I have from you. Well, thanks. He said he bought the phone floater, the feeder chimney, the power meter handle, and the work tray. Awesome. He called it amazing work tray. It really is. It's super handy. Okay. Uh, Sean says, would you recommend the Red Sea Max E170 or the Reefer 200? I don't know. I'd have to look at the models uh, to give you a solid answer on that. But uh, I do like the Red Sea all-in-one kits that have everything. I just feel like that's really convenient for someone that's starting off or someone that just wants to set up a tank with minimal effort. And uh, But I don't know those specifically to give you an answer. I'd have, to, Like I said, I'd have to look them up. Uh, B Money's Aquatics says, what are your thoughts on painting the back of the acrylic tank? You can. You can paint it. Um, you could also use vinyl and apply it just like you would window tint. And usually you use soapy water and you put the vinyl on there and you use a squeegee and you push out all the bubbles and let it cure for, I don't know, overnight or so, and then it's done. And if you ever want to, you can peel the vinyl off. With paint, it's kind of forever. I mean, I assume it's possible to maybe... Maybe the paint would peel off. I, I haven't painted acrylic on, intentionally, so I can't answer on that one. But that, yes, it is something you can do. Oh, thank you. Uh, I will fix that link, guys. I'm sorry. I didn't realize that was a problem. I must have hit an extra key when I hit enter. Uh, Macy's Daddy says, how's the new website coming? I don't know. The uh, web developer said, Mark, I, I want to show it to you right now, but I don't. I want to blow you away. I'm like, oh, so I'm just waiting. Because you know me, I'm super patient. Ah, uh, thank you, Martinez. I appreciate that. I, I don't speak metric. <laughs> I really don't. So yeah, if eight millimeter is quarter inch, then yes, you could definitely use that. I apologize for not knowing metric math, people. Uh, Brian says, I couldn't find the two-part fish dip on your site. Yes, you know, do you sell it? It's called Safety Stop. I have a video about it on this channel. And if you look in the description of the video, there's a link straight to it. But you can go into Google and you can type Safety Stop, Milo's Reef, and boom, it'll take you right to that link. And uh, yes, I do. I sell them. They're $5 a package. Wow. Mark Waller says, is there any way to take the sag out of the top piece of an aquarium? My tank is 480 gallons, eight feet by four feet, and the center sags one inch. That is amazing. Uh, is this tank full of water? 
because the pressure of the water pushing the tank apart would lift the top up rather than hang down. That is fascinating. I'm wondering how thin the material was they used on the top because usually they may not want to use quite a thick a material on the top as they do on the sides, you know, because it's just the top. But uh, that's weird. No, I can't think of anything to take the sag out. Sorry. Very, very strange. Um, Refer Vapes says, I'm new to reefing, thanks to you, and I've noticed that the divider in my all-in-one tank is a little bowed in the filter area. Should I worry? Can I use one of your auto feeder holders in it? Um, the piece that's bowed is probably fine. I mean, obviously you can keep your eye on it. Maybe there's a defect, maybe it, there was a mistake made, but odds are it's okay. And um, then you asked if the auto feeder would fit on it, or you said in it. <laughs> it needs a solid surface somewhere for the base to sit. So this is the auto feeder bracket that I sell to you guys. And it, it makes so much sense to me, but there's so many people like, how do I make that hold onto my tank? And in my tank, I have an overflow with an overflow cover and I set it on there and it stays in place because of the weight of the auto feeder. And if you're not trusting it, I include Velcro that you can put right here and you can Velcro to the lid so it stays. But obviously this end could pull down over time. So you wanna make sure you've got it set up in a secure way so you don't drop your auto feeder into the water. But this is a method that makes the food drop into the tank, stay wet, the fish will either come up and get it or it'll drizzle down into the reef and it won't just go over the, you know, the teeth of the overflow box into the sump or the socks. So uh, I've been making these things for a long time. I've sold a lot of these. But you need a spot to put it. And if you don't have a spot, if I can make you a lid to put over that area to put it on, you'll get an auto feeder and a lid. You, know, you just have to buy two things instead of just one. Um, Smoke and Reefer says, what type of small DIY things can I make? A skimmer stand, container boxes are great. Any other good ideas? You could make a little thing to uh, keep your rock enemies in or to get mushrooms to attach to you know, uh, rock rubble, for example. You could make a little frag rack tray of some kind and you could drill holes in it, put frag plugs, and you could glue that to a cleaning, uh, to a cleaning magnet, like I'm using in the video there. And that way you could actually secure the frag rack on the tank if you like that. I actually am going to have to break down and put a frag rack of maybe one plug. My little frag that I got from Aquashella, it's actually right under Spock in the video. It's bright pink under my elbow. That was $200 and it has grown all these babies and suddenly it is changing colors and the middle is missing some life, which makes me think the copper band butterfly hit it trying to get something to eat. And I don't want to lose that coral. So I'm going to remove it from that rock and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna put it on its own little spot and hang it in the enemy cube where I know it's safe. I don't think the hippo's gonna mess with it. I don't think anything's gonna mess with it and give it a chance to recover and hopefully heal up and get healthy. The weird thing is all the other acans are totally fine, but that one got attacked. I'm like, dang it. So I, I don't wanna lose it because it costs a lot. And I don't like to spend money on corals. <laughs> so I actually know what that one costs and I don't wanna lose it. So today I'm getting my arm wet. But you said, are there any other great ideas? Um, I have made all kinds of acrylic things over time. I made a, a way to hold cooling fans in place. I made a little tripod thing to hold a pH probe meter where it hung on the edge of my sump and every time I opened the door I could just read the pH of my tank. Um, I made a, uh, a little handle for my Mandarin diner. <laughs> There's lots of, you know, the more you put your brain into it and I've made things in the house to make my life easier. At one point, uh, my son's X Xbox needed a place to put the controller, so I made a little bracket we hung on the wall and you stuck the controllers in it. So, and I've made all kinds of things all over my house made of acrylic just because. Mojave is at Lorax, he's, he's asking for a funny story. I happen to have one. He said, what made you start working with acrylic in the first place? All right, so, Everyone sit back, it's story time with me, Lev. I walked into a fish store and I said, I've got this 29 gallon aquarium and I wanna have a sump. And the guy said, then you're gonna need an overflow box. And I said, what's that? So he reached over on the shelf and he showed me one. And it was just this piece of plastic. And he says, water will go through a tube from one box to the other box. 
And he says, this will drain it down. And you put your sump underneath and you use a pump to push it up. I said, okay, got it. So I said, how much is the overflow box? And he said, $100. <laughs> and this was way back, like in 2000 or so. And 2002, I don't know, somewhere in then. I'd have to look at my dates. But I was just like, $100 for a piece of plastic? Are you out of your mind? I was super annoyed. And uh, I just felt like there's no way it's worth that much money. So I told the guy, I said, I'm not paying for that. That's crazy. And this other employee heard me. And so when I was away from, I guess I was talking to the shop owner. So the employee pulled me aside and he said, you should look up on the internet. You should look up weir. I said, what the hell is a weir? And he said, well, you'll look it up. I was like, okay, how do you spell weir? <laughs> so he told me, and I type in weir into Google, and I look at Google Images, and there was like one photograph on the web of a weir. And it was like this big on the internet. It was like a thumbnail. I don't know why it was so small. It was like an avatar. It was so tiny. So I saved that file to my desktop, and then I opened up Paint, and I expanded it to make it really big. And now I had like five big pixels on my screen. I still didn't know what it was. So I stand way far back from the computer, close one eye slightly. I'm like, I think I know what that is. So I went to and I looked up acrylics or plastics in the yellow pages. And I found a company in Fort Worth that sold acrylic. And I went in there and I said, look, I need this much acrylic and I need some kind of glue. And he said, we got a bin over here. You can get whatever you want. It's cheap because it's scraps. And then you're going to need this glue. And I think he was probably the weld on 16. And uh, I spent like $17. And I went home and I made my overflow box. And I, that's where it all started. It was just me not wanting to pay $100 for something. <laughs> and uh, I made the overflow box. And then I ended up making a sump. And then I made another sump. And then I started making little things for make my life easier. And uh, it all got started there. And people saw what I was making and they said, can you make me that? I'm like, I don't know, I guess. And uh, people started requesting things. And the funny part was, like I said, I made stuff with, you know, not knowing what I was doing initially. So when somebody say, I want to order your sump, I like the Model E, for example, or something like that. And they'd come over to pay, they'd see my little sump that was under my 29 gallon and they're like, it's not going to look like that, is it? I was like, no, 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 that was my very first sump. <laughs> Don't worry, yours is going to be way nicer. And, uh, you know, when they came to pick it up, like, okay, that's awesome. But I realized I have to replace my own sump now because I make much nicer stuff. And so way back then, you know, I took out my, my I'd probably been running it for about a year, year and a half. I made a nicer version with quarter inch acrylic and better, you know, solvent and nice edges. And, you know, it, it was much cleaner. It's on my website. And uh, if you go to, uh, my website milosreef.com and you click on my tanks and you go to past tanks you can go to the 29 gallon section there's like five pages about the 29 gallon and you can see the original sump and you can see the nicer sump I made later I document everything I save it forever and uh, so when people came over and they saw that sump they're like oh I can't wait to get one just like that and uh, that's kind of how it all got started Uh, B Speak says, is Lexan just another type of acrylic? Yes, you just want to make sure you're talking about acrylic. Uh, Jeff K says, I'm thinking about getting 150 gallon, I assume. So what size sump do you recommend? I like to put in the biggest sump I can squeeze into the stand. That's my personal preference. It gives you room to have a lot of space in the sump. There's plenty of water volume. There's room to add more gear later if you choose to. Um, you can get into it to clean it. So, you know, if your tank is uh, five feet long, if you can put a sump in there that's four feet long, that's awesome. You know, I would, I try to avoid small sumps. I like to have bigger sumps with lots of room. Martinez, congratulations. I'm very happy the copper band is doing well. And yeah, that would be awful seeing your yellow tang attack it. So I'm glad they're doing well. Um, Smoke and Reefer says, have you ever thought about making your own tank full of tank with sump? Well, I made the sump underneath. 
and uh, made the top off container, made everything underneath. And the uh, stand was welded by a welder, the tank was made by a tank builder. I have considered, you know, if this tank finally lets go, maybe I would just build something out of acrylic, and maybe I'd make like a lagoon style tank so it's shorter and I can just look down from above. It wouldn't be nearly as interesting because it'd be, you know, this tall. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've got a backup. You know, let's say it's this tall or so. It wouldn't be my 30 inches I'm used to. So I, uh, I thought about that as a possibility. Thanks, Derek. I know the top is the best way to look at the tank. That's the way you should look at your tank. Look from above. Uh, Vit says, I just got an XHO 72 inch LED. I bought it to 50 50, which is white blue. Is it okay for a reef? Yes, it is. But yeah, it's a little too white. I agree with you. Um, I like the super tinic version that's just all the blues or blues and violets or whatever the color that spectrum is. I love it. The 50 50 didn't really do much for me. <clears throat> Anchor, quit trying to get me to change to a different liquor. I like my crown and I have plenty of it. I can't go buying all these different liquors. Oh, great question. Can you unglue acrylic once it's been set without having to cut it? No, actually you can't. Once they are welded together into one, there's no removing it. You can try to break it off. You'll have a jagged edge. You're gonna spend a lot of time trying to clean it up. Usually in a scenario like that, it's better to scrap the project or shrink the project and glue a new piece in, cutting off what went wrong. Um, I've had a few times where I had to do something like that and it was a real bummer. I was like, all right. Or like I realized I glued a baffle in the wrong spot so I, I was able to break it off while the glue hadn't quite set, but I had this horrible line, and that big piece of acrylic became a scrap I'd cut lots of little things out of, and I got a new piece of acrylic, you know, to start over again with the bath on the correct spot. I hate it when I make mistakes. D says, what's your par? How dare you, sir, <laughs> or ma'am? <laughs> uh, I don't know by heart. Uh, I'd have to get in there and measure again. It's been a while. But I do have some numbers on my website. See. Hey, Carlos, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate it. Uh, ben says, what's your opinion on Aptasia X? I've used it many times over the years, and it does seem to knock them back, but I never got rid of them entirely. Um, I think if I stayed proactive and kept working on them, as quick as I found one and just like meticulously did not let up, I probably could have beat it entirely. But uh, my main reef has basically none. There's like one in the back of that big acro. Um, actually, that acro right above my head. <laughs> There's one in the back that I could get my arm wet and reach in there and put something on and kill it. That'd be nice. But the anemone cube's got them, and the anemone cube is anemones, and Aptasia are little anemones, so technically they have the right to live there, but I really don't like them and I want them gone. Um, so using Aptasia X or F Aptasia, both the kinds that I would recommend at this point. F Aptasia is getting a really good uh, reputation with people. Yeah, so if the tank is empty, when you fill it up with water, you might discover that that piece of acrylic lifts up because the walls swell outward. That would be my guess. I think it's just hanging there because, like you said, it's hanging and gravity is doing its thing on it 24-7. See, that's what I was thinking. That's what I was afraid of. Lexan was a brand of polycarbonate. I was going to say plexiglass, I know is acrylic. Lexan, I had a feeling, was polycarbonate, so I'm glad you looked that up. Uh, Jason says, what did I miss? He was busy painting. Well, I want to see what you're painting. We're not going to answer you until you show us what you did. Uh, Carl Murray says, I'm new to reefing, just cycled my tank. It's a 60 gallon setup with a 20 gallon sump. I'm getting ready to install a DIY algae scrubber. Do you think I still need a protein skimmer? Yes, I always recommend a protein skimmer, but if you don't want one or, you, or you're not ready to do one now, that's okay. You can focus on water changes as your means of exporting nutrients and uh, see how it goes. But I love protein skimmers because they drive off CO2, which helps raise the tank pH and they do pull out waste. I mean, they are proven as an excellent tool. 
And I put a protein skimmer on every tank I run. Uh, Nathan says, is the place downtown in Fort Worth open that does plexiglass? They moved. They're in Dallas now. So you could look for Allied Plastic or Regal Plastic for acrylic. Um, there's also some other companies. Um, it's on the tip of my tongue. But Allied and Regal are the two main ones. Uh, Port Plastic is another one here in the area. Um, there's another one too. I mean, I've been to them all. <laughs> Did I tell you guys that last week I had a truck show up with five more sheets? Uh, I had placed an order with one company. They didn't fulfill it. You know, they showed up with nothing. They showed up with like two things. And I was like, where's my acrylic? And they said, we're out of stock. And I was like, are you, when are you getting more? And they said, we have no idea because of COVID-19. I was like, all right. And uh, I said, are you going to call me when you get it in? Are you going to just surprise me? And he says, oh no, I'll let you know. Don't worry. And I was like, all right. So in the meantime, you know, I hung up the phone and I don't know, 20 minutes later, I was calling a different company and they had 200 sheets in stock and I got my acrylic I needed. And then randomly this truck showed up, uh, I guess it was last week. And he says, I'm here with your acrylic. I'm like, what acrylic? So five more sheets showed up and they are totally in my way right now because I'd gotten my other supply. Uh, I'd gotten my supply resupplied. So now I had this extra. Um, by the way, guys, if you can put at Mila's Reef, it really helps me find your questions. Uh, Reef Peef says, why are you guys in the U.S. drive with such a high uh, KH, or what we call DKH? In Germany, most of us run a KH of 7.5, um, and calcium is 420 and 35 PPT. What's the reason behind it? The higher alkalinity is, um, it comes with nutrients. So if you have a low nutrient system, low nitrate, low phosphate, you run low DKH. If you have high nitrate, high phosphate, you have high DKH. And, you know, we've been aiming for somewhere between 8 and 11 forever. I mean, that's been the target. And you guys have chosen to be under the target, which I don't know why you do that in Germany. But uh, 7.5 is close to 8. You could almost round it up and call it 8. So, I mean, that's not wrong. But uh, I keep my tank at 9.5. Uh, Hillbilly Reefer says, how do you bend acrylic? You know, do you use heat? I've seen rounded corners before. Well, I rounded these over the router bit, but I do melt acrylic with a propane torch. And it's a simple thing where you just hold the acrylic in front of you and you run the, the flame back and forth. But it is, um, it's not precise. You are basically aiming for a certain area of the acrylic. You are heating it up. And then even as you bend it, it's very hard to square it up and get a nice clean bend. It's more like you're going to get kind of a do-it-yourself hook, <laughs> if that makes any kind of sense. Uh, there are certain things that just don't matter how they're bent, so it's like whatever. But some things, if you're looking for precision, like you want a perfect bend for like an overflow box, I would. No, I don't do that. I literally only glue two pieces together and create a 90 degree. But uh, there are heat strips out there where you can actually make a, a, a hot table and lay your acrylic on top and let it heat the acrylic. You might even have to flip the acrylic and then you can do a fold and get the nice clean bend. That's one method that I've never done. I've seen it done. I've just never done it. But using the torch works. The thing is, if you run the torch too long on the acrylic, it'll bubble. You'll actually see bubbles appearing in the acrylic and you're boiling it. <laughs> so what you want to do is you want to heat it up and then you want to turn the sheet over and heat the other side and then turn it back and heat the other side. And you keep doing this. I basically have a kind of a thing where I'm, if I'm holding up, my piece of acrylic here, and I've got my torch right here. I will go back and forth basically 20 passes at this speed, give or take. And the flame's like way back here. And I'm just heating it up, and I count to 20, and then I turn it over, and I go to 20. And then I come back here, and I go to 20, and then I come back here and go to 20. And eventually, you'll actually see this weird, like, ripply clearness compared to the rest of the acrylic. And you can see how it's rated, and you can try to pull on it. And if it starts to bend, if it's, if it's got resistance, a little bit more heat on both sides, and then you go whoop, and it just comes right over. And then it, once you've got it at the 90 degree and you're happy, or the 45 degree, whatever shape you're doing, you can put it under cold water and that'll quickly lock it into that position. Or you can hold it still and wait a couple of minutes for it to cool down. But that's one method. I never, ever, 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 ever use a torch on a seam or a glue joint. 
You never heat up glued joints because it weakens the seam. The bond that you made will get ruined by heat. So the only thing that I would heat up would be, for example, on the skimmer stand, I would heat up the edge of this and the edge, and I can you know do the edge here and I can do the bottom. But I don't want to get any of this part here where I've glued it because that'll ruin it. And so on the on the sumps that have a flange on the top, I heat up the inner rim to make it pretty, and so it's not sharp when you reach in. But uh, I don't, like I said, you don't heat the outer corners. If you want shiny corners, you need to buff those. Thanks for asking that question. Uh, Brian says, I'm looking to start dosing. What would be the best method? I don't have a sump, but I have a hang on back refugium. I'm trying to keep LPS and softies. It's a 125 gallon tank. You're going to probably, well, I don't know. Are you going to dose manually or are you going to dose uh, by hand? <laughs> That's the same question. Are you going to dose with dosing pumps or are you going to dose manually? Um, if, whichever one you're going to do, you want to dose in an area of high flow. So if you're pouring it in the tank each day, you want to pour it in right in front of a power head so it just dissipates quickly into the reef. If you're going to have dosing pumps, you know, mounted somewhere and they're going to a jug of solution or a bottle of some kind and then it trickles into the tank, again, it needs to trickle in in an area of high flow. You definitely don't want to just go in somewhere that seems to be out of the way because you'll get this weird uh, dense or condensed amount of solution in a small area. It'll create weird uh, film on the wall of the tank. Um, corals in that area might get... Uh, unhappy because they're getting hit with way too much of a chemical because it's not mixing and diluting rapidly. So you always want to really to trickle into an area of high flow. That's the absolute, whether you have a sump or not. Uh, not sure if I understand this question. Visionary Promotion says, do you turn uh, your lights all the way off. Do you mean do I turn my lights off completely? Yes. Every night my tank's in total darkness from midnight forward. Uh, Kevin, he says, my first tank was a bowed tank. So the way they do the bowed tanks is they actually take the big sheet of acrylic and they put it over a form that is pushed into an oven and the acrylic's straight as an arrow and they bake that acrylic for a certain amount of time. Let's say hours. And the acrylic will just form over that shape and then you know they'll turn off the oven and they roll it back out and they cool it you know and let it just kind of you know let it sit and then they'll trim it all up and get it ready to glue together that's way different than trying to do uh, and you cannot bake your own acrylic in your own oven at home either don't do that Uh, Nikki says, I'm getting a 184 gallon tank and it needs to be picked up. How many people would you say I should bring when the glass is 15 millimeters? What is with you guys in the metric numbers? No, I'm joking. That's fine. You need four people minimum. Um, four people would do it. Uh, that would be doable. If you want to have an extra couple of hands, like people to hold a door open or, you know, move things out of your way or assist in some way, having two extras is always nice. Having a total of six people really spreads out the weight, but four people should be able to handle it. And if you can get your hand on the suction cups that you put on the glass and you hit the plunger and it grabs on, that is awesome. That's like carrying a coffin and everyone's got a handle to hold on to instead of holding on to the edges of a sump. I mean, the edges of a tank, that, uh, display tank that's, you know, I, I can't tell if it's been used or not, but typically if it's a used tank you're picking up, the salt on it makes them slippery. <clears throat> so cleaning the glass really good and putting the suction cups on is a really safe way of moving an aquarium, and I highly recommend it. If you don't have the suction cups, you might be able to borrow them from your fish store or possibly rent them from your fish store, or you just buy yourself some and they are yours forever. Uh, Smoking Reefer says, my 220 gallon aquarium comes in four weeks. If I swap everything from the current aquarium Will it, it be fully cycled or will I go through the diatoms phase again? Would you move the sand bed over? Okay, so there's a lot in that question. Number one, I need some coffee. Okay, if the tank is only six months old or less, you can move the sand bed over with no problem. If the tank is older than six months and that sand bed is older than six months, do not use that sand the way it is. You're going to want to take all the sand out and you're going to wash it 
rinse out all the detritus, and put the clean sand in your new tank. You can transfer all of your rock over, you can transfer all your livestock over. You should not have a cycle if you kept the rock wet the whole time. So in other words, the 120 gallon tank, you took the rock out of the tank and you put it in a trash can and you drained water out of the tank into the trash can to keep the rock submerged at all times. Now it's sitting in water the whole time and you move it to the wherever it's gonna go. You get the 220 in place and you bring your barrel of salt water and rocks and you put the rock in the tank and add salt water again, it's not gonna cycle. But if the rock is sitting out in the air for hours and hours, then yes, you could have a cycle because all the sponges on and in the rock are gonna die. And as they die and as bacteria dies, it releases ammonia and you can actually have a mini cycle. So if you're doing a tank transfer like you sound like you're doing and you're keeping everything submerged as much as possible, only exposing things to air briefly, you should not encounter a cycle at all. The washing of the sand does not cycle a tank. It doesn't do anything but give you nice clean sand. It is completely safe to use, but it won't have any life in it. It'll just be a sand bed. And you're gonna have to add some live sand to repopulate it with bacteria. <laughs> Tim Mattel says, <laughs> just to close out last week's topic, a non-reefer came over to compliment him on his aquarium, and she liked how I was making the sand bed red. <laughs> Meaning the cyanobacteria. Nailed it! Yes, yeah, see? Someone that knows nothing about the aquarium will point out all the best parts of your tank and make you feel better about it. Even the really pretty red sand you're creating. That is awesome! So funny. Uh, Visionary Promotions, you were asking me over and over and over about light schedules. So I've been seeing your questions. I kind of answered one earlier, so I, I skipped about three or four of them. I'm always at least 20 minutes behind on the chat, just in case you didn't know. Um, I like your light schedule to be about, you know, the, the real light of the day, the one where you're growing corals. I like to keep that around seven hours a day. And then if you want to ramp up an hour before or an hour and a half before and ramp down an hour and a half after to extend your day a little bit longer, that's perfectly fine but I totally avoid the 12 hour, 14 hour day periods that people like to do, or even that some light companies build into the light fixture as their default. It's a weird default that makes no sense to me at all. So I don't recommend super long days. You know, if you, I mean, this time of year, depending where you live, depending on the equinox, you know, you look outside, maybe the, you start to see daylight at 6.30 in the morning, but this room was dark and my tank was dark. And I got up around, 9.30 today, and uh, by the time I got near the tank, it was like 10, 10.30. It's been raining all night. It's been cloud cover today. There's no sunlight, and the tank was dark. And the first light, which is just a little strip of blue lights, came on at 11 a.m., and it was just a hint of a glow. That was it. And uh, so the tank was dark from midnight all the way until 11 a.m., and then the first little light came on. And then my XHOs came on 30 minutes after that. Then my first metal halide turned on at one o'clock in the afternoon, and it's gonna run until seven. My second metal halide comes on at 2.15 and turns off at 8.15. And my third metal halide comes on at 3.30 and turns off at 9.30. So each of those lights is six hours. But I stagger them, which makes the period feel longer to me. And, uh, and then my XHOs turn off around 11 o'clock or so, and then the final strip is 11.30. So, uh, that's because the high noon, the, when you're giving the tank all that intensity, doesn't need to... I mean, think of it when the sun is overhead over a real reef in the ocean, when it is just blasting down on the reef. That, that noon doesn't last for 14 hours. They get hit with a direct amount of sunlight when the sun is directly overhead for a fixed amount of hours. And then the rest of the time, the sun's either off to the side or it's off to the other side, and it's just working its way across, and there's all kinds of shadows, and there's a lot of less intensity. And if you've ever dove in a swimming pool, you know the difference being in a pool when the sun is low versus when it's directly overhead. It's the same thing with our tanks. So I like to recommend the high noon, the super intense, the most light you do with whatever fix you're using, is about four hours at the most. And But I was giving you like you know something like six if you want to go a little longer. And then you ramp up, ramp down. I hope that really answers it. 
I have a video on here on this channel that says how long should I run my lights daily. Watch that video. I hope it'll help you. Um, Cue Balls Reef says, is it possible to drill an established tank? I have a hang on, back over, hang on back overflow and want to switch. Well, you know, occasionally there's that one person that uh, will drill a tank that's running. <laughs> Literally drill it vertically, which is insane. The rule of thumb when you're going to drill anything is you have your aquarium, like let's say this is your aquarium, and you want to put a hole right here. So you would then set the aquarium on its side and you're going to drill down with a wet glass, uh, a diamond tip saw bit that can cut through glass. And so you drill through there. So to turn the tank on its side means empty the tank, take it outside and uh, do this job, which takes about five minutes or so to drill one hole. And if you're going to do two holes, it's going to take you 10 minutes. It's super loud. It's crazy loud as it's scoring its way through the glass over and over. It's, it's really, really loud. And I was wondering if my neighbors would be pissed, but you know, it was daytime, so it didn't matter. And then once it's drilled, you rinse it all up and you install your bulkhead and you reinstall it in place and you start hooking up plumbing and you can put your livestock back in. But occasionally there's this one random guy who lowered the water level in the tank and he drilled this way, which is insane, and had someone nearby with like a spray bottle squirting water on it the whole time and water's just running down and they're trying to drill through. I would never, ever, ever do that. But it's been done. So it depends how crazy you are. I wouldn't recommend it. If you, I don't know what size tank you have, but let's say you have something small, like a 20 gallon or a 29 gallon or a 40 gallon breeder, something easy to get another one of. I would actually recommend you just drill a new tank that's brand new, drill the holes in it, install the overflow box, and then swap tanks out and get yourself a brand new tank that's drilled and works great and doesn't have any scratches on the front glass because you're starting fresh and transfer all your livestock into that. And I think that would be super nice by comparison. But I mean, if you have a big tank, you don't have that choice. Uh, Rick G says, have you heard of anyone dosing a small amount of ChemiClean to help with cyano so you don't have to do a water change? Not all of it comes out with a water change anyway. Um, no, you dose the proper amount and you dose it. Okay, so here's my routine. Turn off the protein skimmer, remove any carbon, stop any UV, all that stuff, you know, all those accessories, stop using any of that. Dose the chemical in the tank. You might need to add an air stone for oxygenation to keep your livestock safe. And you just let it uh, simmer, so to speak, for three days. After three solid days, 72 hours later, if you don't see any cyano at all, you can take 25% of the water out of the tank, replace it with new salt water that's, you know, you made, and then turn on your skimmer and deal with the mess. If you still see cyano, then treat the tank again and wait two more days. And now the cyano should be completely gone. And now you can do the water change and turn on the skimmer and, you know, deal with the, the collection cup overflowing. But, uh, Doing a small amount, trying to work on it a little bit, that never works out. And you actually could build it up to where it becomes a, a chemical tolerant. It doesn't want to die because it, it's gotten used to that little bit. So we have to use the proper amount and just follow the directions uh, that I suggested. And I have this written up on my website too. Uh, I sell something that's like chemically, it's called Red Cyano RX. As far as I know, it's the same ingredients. But I mean, I don't know that for a fact because I don't know what's in it. But uh, I use the exact same approach with both products. I've used ChemiClean 50 times. I've used Red Sign RX 40 times. And it does the job and does the job well in three to five days. So that's my recommendation. Now, the part about the protein skimmer that I kind of glossed over, I have a short five minute video that's called Make It Stop. And the skimmer's overflowing like crazy because of a chemical in the water. And typically like with ChemiClean or Red Sign RX or uh, Reef Booster from Prodibio, these things make a protein skimmer overflow. And if you will just let the skimmer overflow as much liquid as it wants to dump out, just let it drain into a bucket, throw that bucket out, put the bucket back, let it drain some more, and keep adding new salt water for whatever you're losing through the skimmer. Eventually, you'll within, I'd say, six hours or so, you'll get the skimmer under control. If you try anything else other than what I just recommended, it will take you weeks to get it resolved. <laughs> So I'm saying just let the skimmer overflow. Let it drain into a bucket. Dump the cup out 16 times an hour if you have to for the first hour. The next hour will be 12 times. The next hour will be 10 times. The next hour will be 4 times. And then finally it'll settle down. 
And then, you know, like I said, it takes you like six hours or so. And now you've got the skimmer back under control and the tank is doing great and the cyano is gone and you're happy. It's just kind of a hassle. But you can do it. I know you can. Um, Heather says, is adding salt water the easiest and more accurate way to add salinity to a system? I'm at 1.025. You're kind of at that sweet spot. You could aim for 1.026, go up slightly. Yes, adding a little more salt water to the tank instead of top off water will raise the salinity up. But then as soon as you're at 1.026, you want to switch back to RODI water for top off. Tim B says, hey Mark, just want to thank you for the great footage. I've been wanting to see the corals in your reef like that for a long time. The new style is fantastic. Yeah, I like doing this. I think it's, it's much nicer instead of me standing in front of a tank that looks like nuclear radiation hit it. So yeah, this is the third week in a row we're doing the streams this way, and I think it's just so much better this way. Uh, Marcus... Aurelius says, if you're drilling a tank that's tempered, good point. So if you have an aquarium that has tempered glass, and Reef Dudes did a video where they were drilling a tank to show how to do it, and the whole glass just shattered at the very end. Tempered glass cannot be drilled. Only, uh, un I guess, untempered glass can be drilled. So the way I understand it, and uh, I only Googled this once, and I might remember it incorrectly, but I believe the way it works, if you needed a hole in glass, and you needed it tempered. I think what they do is they cut the glass, they polish the edges, they drill the hole, you know, they do everything you need, and then they temper it. And I think tempering it is baking it. So once it's been baked, if that's the actual process, then the uh, you, you can no longer drill a hole in it. <laughs> it's tempered glass is like the sliding doors of your back door of your house or um, your windshield on your car. These are all designed to break in a million little pieces instead of giant shards that can cut through your jugular and slice open your wrists with big pieces of glass. It's, it's supposed to shatter in lots of little pieces. And they use tempered glass in tanks to protect the consumer. But oftentimes the problem, the part that's tempered is usually the bottom, but sometimes the back is tempered. So you need to find out what your tank is made of. Uh, Tim says, what are the nitrate numbers lately since the scrubber install? I checked them last week and it was still around 45. Um, I haven't checked yet today. Today is water test Saturday. Thank you for the segue. So today's water test Saturday. Let me go full screen so I can berate you people properly. I gotta do this the way. There. All right, water test Saturday. You wanna test your tank. You wanna measure all your parameters. You wanna make sure all your dosing pumps are full of liquid. You wanna make sure that the dosing tubes are not clogged up and sealed up and letting liquid pass through them. You wanna make sure that everything is correct. Maybe even calibrate something. Um, and then if you have to adjust anything, now is the time to do it because you want to catch it before it gets really out of whack. So if you're dosing alkalinity and calcium and magnesium and those numbers are all the same week after week after week, don't change anything. Just make sure they're running properly. But if your alkalinity is getting too high, you need to dial back the dosing a little bit less this week. And then again, check next week and see if you're at that sweet spot again. It's really important that you do test. And, you know, I tell you guys, do not... Just look at your tank and say it looks fine because it doesn't. See? See how bad the tank looks behind me? That's why I don't do that in the background anymore. All right, so I want you to test your water. I know some of you guys are using Reef Trace, which is an app I'm a partner in. And it's a great app for tracking all your water parameters. You can you have all these really cool graphs. You can pick the test kit you're using. Matter of fact, there's a new release rolling out. I'm probably not supposed to say anything, but I will anyway. It's going to include a bunch more kits, which is awesome. Um, there's some other stuff they've done in there that is, uh, like I said, the announcement will go out in the next few days, I'm sure. But, uh, and it's for iOS and for Android. iOS is usually the one that comes out first because I, I'm just throwing a number in the air, but I think it's like 90% of users or iOS users, only like 10% are on Android. I don't know why, but that's just what it is. And so they focus on iOS first. All right, back to the video. Uh, Jeff says, what are the pros and cons of an internal box versus an overflow on the back? An internal box on a drilled tank 
will essentially never fail <laughs> because it's got holes in the bottom and water is just draining down through gravity. Where a hang on back overflow box uses a siphon method where it's sucking water over the top and you have to make sure that no air is getting trapped inside the U-tube. And you, you know, so if you do see air building up, you have to remove the air so it's pure water again. And you have to have the right flow rate to maintain it. And you gotta keep an eye on it. You don't hear people keeping an eye on their internal overflow boxes. They're just, they just know they work. And I never think about my overflow boxes now. But back when I had the 29 gallon and as well when I had the 55 gallon, one had the one I made myself, one came with one. And every day I would lift the, the little thing I put on top that shielded it from light getting on it so it wouldn't grow algae. And I just look. And I did that every single day. And I did that for a long time. All right, let's switch videos. Did we do this one yet? Can't tell which one we did. All right. I think it's the other one. Sorry, one second here. One more intro. <laughs> um, I feel like we did this one. I fail at this. You know, I'm just gonna run it. I don't care. All right. Um, I've been on the lookout for something like the Shadow Caster. Did you say it was a tort? No, the Shadow Caster is not a tort. It's in the Staghorn family, but it is not a uh, the blue tort or green tort or any of those torts. It's its own thing. And I don't know what it actually is. I don't know the species. I don't even know where I, who I got it from. Uh, Tia tells us, when, in your opinion, would you say is maintenance on the X1 doser, like tube replacement, etc.? Uh, you know, I don't really have an answer for you. Mine's just been running flawlessly. I've probably had it going for a year or so. It might be worth looking into. I don't even know where you get, I mean, I haven't even investigated where to get the replacement tubes. I mean, it all comes in Coral View, but I haven't heard anything if you like replace the, uh, the head itself with the tube in it, or if you can open it to take that little piece out. Uh, mine just has been working, so I haven't really given any thought. I, matter of fact, once I set it, I don't even really go to much trouble like to recalibrate and verify things up and up, which I probably should be doing. <laughs> Tim says, hey Mark, rumor has it that Spock also drinks Crown Royal with you from a straw. Is there any truth to this, and is she actually 21? Uh, <laughs> nope, she's underage, and she does not get any. She only gets bananas. Uh, Heather Price says, is there any thought of getting a waterproof camera for close-up views of animals and angles you can't view from outside the tank? Well, I make a box that you set on the top of the tank and you can drop your phone into it and you can take pictures from above. I also make a box that you mount a DSLR into and you can get nice macro shots. And I've done that. The problem is like with my tank, my corals are all up near the surface. And a lot of times the DSLR macro lenses need to be X, you know, amount of inches away from the lens so the core has to be far enough away to be in focus and if you're too close you can't focus so it's one of those tricky situations where you have to find that sweet spot and sometimes certain corals just can't be photographed the way i want to there are other methods like killing all the flow in the tank literally stopping every ripple and hoping your fish cooperate and you mount the camera up on a tripod way up high and you know use a countdown timer and you shoot and hope no fish swims through and uses their fin like a shark to ripple the water and ruin the shot. I've seen people do that where they try to get right through the crystal clear water. Like this right here, This you can see the ripples, but that's coming from the vortex are still running. Because I never completely turn off all the flow in the tank. But putting a camera underwater, no I haven't done that. Uh, Kevin, that's that was the general consensus, only test what you can dose. But there's certain things we dose these days that we really aren't able to test for. Like, for example, amino acids. Or, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, there's, you know, there's some concoctions out there where people are doing some really wild uh, chemistry. And they're relying on ICP tests to kind of uh, make sure that they're staying within range with the base model. But they are still also adding weird this and that, like witch hazel and so forth into the tank to get certain colors to pop. 
So, and those are certain things you really can't test for. It's kind of trial and error, and you have to make sure that you're really staying on top of it. You can't be haphazard with that one. Jamie says, I remember you mentioned you're going to be on Reef Dudes live stream soon. That's going to be on May 20th, should be next Wednesday, I believe. So that's coming up, and that'll be uh, in the evening, probably around 5 or 6 p.m. Uh, Smoking Reefer says, when I get the new tank, I'll have two return Vectra pumps. How will I know the correct flow rate through the sump? Uh, part of it is going to be kind of a gut instinct. You know, you don't need to run the water through the sump quickly. As a matter of fact, I don't recommend it because, number one, it makes the system very loud and water ricochets through all the different compartments and ends up with micro bubbles in the return zone. The Vectra pumps suck in the micro bubbles and they pump the micro bubbles into the display tank and you look in the tank and there's just bubbles everywhere, just ruining your view. So that would be too much flow. So you would want to dial them down. The beauty of the Vectra is you have a knob. You can turn from 10% to 100%. And you could set both of those pumps around 40, 50% and just see how it looks. And then decide what's sweet, what the sweet spot is for you. There's been some uh, recommendations from BRS recently to run two return pumps instead of one. And uh, I don't necessarily agree with that recommendation. I mean, I kind of get the whole, oh my God, what if the pump fails? I guess maybe pumps aren't made as well as they used to be made. And so that's the risk. But, uh, you, know, in the, you know, if you had a return pump fail, you just took the pump out and put a new one in. So if you own two Vectras, I would put one on the return line and send it up to the tank, and I'd keep one on the shelf as my backup. And then when it fails or it needs to be taken off for maintenance and cleaning, you could either clean it and then put it back on, or you could clean it and put it away, take number two and install it and run it. But... Uh, you know, I've been running the Vectra M1 on my frag tank now for three years. I've taken it apart twice to clean it. I've run an L1 on my system for three years, I guess. And it's uh, been taken apart a few times. It actually got replaced. There was a problem with it, and Ecotech did a warranty replacement. But uh, I don't have dual um, Vectras running. I have a return pump, and it does its job. And if it were to not do its job, I take another one off the shelf and install it. So that's my recommendation. Putting two in the system just means I have two pumps to clean now on a regular basis. There is the chance, I mean, it just, it, th the thing is, most of us are at home with our tanks. And I, I'm not talking about COVID-19. I mean, literally, you're there every single day. You go to work, you go to the movies, you go to dinner, you come home, there's your tank. You're with your tank. And if at some point your pump goes down, you're gonna see it and you're gonna solve it. But if you have two of them running, will you notice that one is offline? You might not even notice for weeks. So I don't know that that's really a good solution. I feel like it's just taking up space in the sump and it's helping them sell an extra pump. And that sounds kind of negative and I'm not trying to be a jerk about it, but I just don't see the need to put two pumps in a sump unless there's an absolute necessity, like you're only going to visit this tank once every 14 days, like a maintenance company. That's different. Uh, or maybe you want to get really creative. Maybe you're trying to do something interesting, like... I want to have the flow run in one side of my tank for 15 minutes, and then I'm going to shut that pump off, I'm going to turn this one on for 15 minutes. And you do this weird cycling back and forth. If you're trying to do that, okay, fair enough, two pumps. I could see it. But yeah, when that video came out, I just, and suddenly everyone starts talking about two pumps, just like everyone's talking about the Inkbird controller with 500 watt heaters. I'm like, what? <laughs> it's too much. All right. Mr. Ezzy says, I tested today knowing that this was on. Yay, thank you. Thank you for remembering Water Test Saturday. Um, okay, Drop Bear says, I am thinking, I love it, Drop Bear. Those are terrifying animals. Um, I'm thinking about buying a 70 to 200 millimeter zoom lens and shooting from a distance. Any thoughts on that? You could do that. It's probably not gonna work in your favor like you think it is. A macro lens is really your friend. And uh, a good tripod is so important. This is, <laughs> I'm gonna hold this up. Let me switch cameras here for a second so you can see it. This is my tripod. And I got this thing a couple years ago. It's pretty small when it's all folded up. I've got my phone on the end of it right now. And uh, I carry this with me on all my trips when I wanna take any videos of people's tanks. And it's a really nice tripod I got off Amazon for probably like a hundred bucks. 
and it is called ProLine Professional Carbon Tripod from Dolica, D-O-L-I-C-A dot com. So I really recommend a good tripod for your camera. And I do recommend a... Now, if you have a Canon, you're going to need a certain uh, macro lens that fits that camera. I have Nikon, and I have a 105 millimeter macro lens. It's great. And when I set it up, I have to set the camera on the tripod, and I have to use a countdown timer. And I have to hope no fish swims into the shot and ruins it. But that way you get really nice close-ups of your corals. Also, there's a 50 millimeter lens that has a closer focal range, so you can get really close on things, um, which works great for top-downs, for example. And I found that I like using that one more than a macro lens inside the top-down photo box. So the 50 millimeter lens is another good one. Uh, there's also something called... What are they called? Extension tubes. And you put the tubes... And there's three different ones. They come in a kit. And you use one, two, or all three with your lens. And it changes the focal distance between the lens and the body of the camera, and it brings things closer. It, it's really cool. You can really zoom in on stuff, but it has to be super stationary because it's a very slow picture. It's going to take the photo, and the shutter's going to be like click, chuck. It's so slow that you know all the flow stops. The polyp on your acroboard is sitting there, not moving, and you get that shot. And it might take. I mean, you could set it to where the shutter's open for three seconds long, or something, or, or seven seconds and you want to get that. That's a really cool one. I did an article about the extension tubes on Reef Addicts, my other website. Uh, Tim says, how long before you calibrate your trident? Is it pretty easy? Yeah, calibration is not hard, and uh, usually it's recommended to do it within, after the unit's been running for 48 hours. And then, you know, when you're changing reagents, that's a good time to go ahead and do a calibration again. Uh, Marine Reef says, what is your cycling method for your tank on a brand new setup? From what product do you use, etc.? What do you add, for example? <laughs> um, the, my method has been to use a raw shrimp when I started a new tank. And I would just get a couple of big shrimp at the deli. And, you know, I'd pay 99 cents a piece and I'd throw them in the tank and let them rot for three days and I'd throw them away. And that's just simple. Nothing suffers. And I get the exact thing I want. But nowadays, people are buying ammonia in a bottle and pouring that in and testing and trying to get the right amount or finding some online calculator to determine how much to use. Um, Brightwell sells a... Well, actually, I sell it now. Uh, there's a new product that came to market recently, and I just ordered another 10 kits of this for anyone that might want it. It's a dry rock starter kit, and it helps establish bacteria in a brand new tank to get you through the cycle. It comes with everything you need. Uh, it comes with the bacteria, comes with the ammonia, comes with Microbacter Clean to deal with the uglies for a couple of months. And uh, I thought that's great because some people are starting their tanks with dry sand and dry rock. And when they came out with that kit, I was like, oh, I bet there's going to be people out there that like this. So I've been sending those out. And I just, like I said, I just ordered more last night to because I ran out. But that's a nice way to start your tank. And supposedly, you'll be able to cycle your tank in roughly seven days instead of three weeks using that kit, which is pretty nice. Um, Tim says, I know you said you don't do tops, but what if you made two rim pieces that can be screwed together and then the customer can then put netting in between and screw it together? My, what are my thoughts? The thing with the tops is it's going to be an enormous amount of acrylic that is, or polycarbonate being used up with a giant hole cut out, and that giant flat thing has to be shipped. It's not going to be cheap. Um, there's companies out there that do it, so I just don't. Plus, I have enough... <laughs> uh, how do I say this without sounding without coming across the wrong way. I already am trying to keep up with the orders I have now, and I appreciate all new orders, but I like orders I have things I do, not trying to carve into another market, so to speak. So, could it be done? Yes. Do I want to do it? No. Um, should I do it? I don't know. But uh, for now, I don't do tops. And uh, there are companies that do. There's a place in Phoenix called Reef Gardens, and they make those tops with the screens, and they're beautiful, and I've seen them in person, and so I point people to them, because they make them. Uh, Crisis Film says, what quirks have you discovered about the Trident? Uh, we got it yesterday and set it up and running. Um, let's see. It really, it's kind of a set it and forget it type of thing. Leave it alone. Don't mess with it. 
Um, I like to, I miss the sound effects it used to make. It used to sound like a little R2-D2 unit and they removed those. It's kind of a bummer. But, uh, you know, you want to watch your reagents, make sure that they are not running out. And that's by looking in Infusion, you can click on the, the module. And each time you click, it shows you more data. And uh, you just want to make sure that you have enough a reagent on hand. And, um... Yeah, no, there's, I mean, you want to make sure that the tubing where the water is being drawn through your, you know, from your sump into the trident, nothing clogs it, you know, nothing obstructs it, it doesn't get air bubbles, you know, it has to be in a good spot. And uh, make sure that the tubes aren't kinked when you're pushing the drawer back in with the reagent bottles, that's about it. There's really nothing weird that you need to know. Yeah, Reefing with O says, well, BRS had a couple of tanks crashed while they were closed over the weekend, so I understand why they would want two return pumps. Yeah, if you're going to be gone away from your tank for a couple of days or so, I can kind of see it. It's also, I mean, think how many tanks they must run there, too. <laughs> Those guys have so many projects going, and, you know, because remember, BRS investigates. It's a really cool series. And with so many setups going, I mean, I've got two tanks going, technically. You know, I've got the enemy cube, and I've got the reef, and then the frag tank I ignore, as you know. And, I mean, everything just kind of runs. And if I walk past something and something's not running, I catch it. And um, that's kind of where I stand on that. Oh, thanks, Andrea, for putting the link. Uh, Drop Bear, so on my website, in the article section, <clears throat> I think there's a photography subsection. Click on that, and it shows all my lenses um, and several of my articles about taking macro shots and super close-ups. And, uh, I mean, I even got pictures of a, a little tiny peppermint fry that had just released in the water, and I caught it in a net, and I put it down on, I don't know what the black surface was, but it was a drop of water with that little fry in there, and I got a picture of him with a penny next to him. And he's like, oh, no, it's copper. <laughs> so, yeah, check that out on my website. Um, it, should, it should help maybe with what lenses I like to use, maybe help you decide what you want to buy. Oh, my God, I'm at the end. I did it. I got to the end of the chat. This is a miracle. I can end the show early today. Yay, yay me. Uh, if you have any more questions, now's your chance before I wrap this up. But, uh, yeah, I don't really have anything else to say today. I think we've kind of hit it all. So it was fun talking about working with acrylic. Like I said, if you have more questions, ask in the, uh, the comments below. Uh, if you weren't part of the live chat now and you're watching this after the fact, and I'll be happy to answer you. Like I said, I'll fix the link that's in the description um, and probably put a couple more links. I have a link in there about how to make your own jig, how to make uh, the top piece, how to route the edge of the acrylic. Um, the tools I use. These are all things I've been documenting for a very, very long time. Uh, D says, how many, with the Nero 5, how many times did you have to clear out snails? I find mine cut off and not running two times a week. I have a screen guard that uh, is on my Nero, so nothing gets into it. It never has a problem with snails. Um, I Before I put that guard on there, the uh, snails were... I saw one sitting on there for a long time, and I thought, man, he's really lazy. <laughs> and so when I went to move him, the shell was empty. I was like, oh, that explains why he hasn't moved in three days. So I have these 3D printed uh, guards that I sell for my website. They're 20 bucks. And I can send one to you. Shipping's cheap. And uh, I ship those for six bucks. And if you want one or if you have multiples and you need them for several, I can do that. I, a, a guy in Canada prints them for me and sends them to me and then I sell them to you guys. I don't print them myself. But uh, it works really well. It's easy to take off and clean with a toothbrush and pop back into place. It's black, and uh, so it kind of matches, you know, or it kind of is invisible, so to speak. And uh, I think that that will protect any kind of livestock from getting into the back of your Nero 5 pump. Uh, Kurt says, what do you recommend for the maintenance schedule on the Vectra pump? I would recommend cleaning it at least once a year. 
You know, if you did it twice a year, that'd be great, but once a year should suffice. And you're going to have to use their Allen wrench to remove the front shroud and then pull out the impeller and clean everything properly. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of a tedious thing, but, you know, you only have to do it once a year. And just make sure everything's nice and clean and working well. Matter of fact, I think the... You said the M... Oh, you didn't say which Vectra, did you? Um, I feel like the M1 doesn't come out. You know, like the impeller won't come out. But the L1 does. It's been so long since I cleaned it, I don't remember. I guess I need to clean it again. <laughs> Reef Trace is shocked to see my Inception. See, that's me. That's my clone. He's, he's working. That's how I get things done. I have an extra one of me. Uh, Jamie says, I've seen a few posts about a product called All for Reef. Apparently provides all the needs in one. Have you any experience with it or know anything about it? No and no, I don't. I mean, I've heard mentioned, I haven't dug into it. <laughs> I know, I'm trying to read what Marcus wrote. Uh, if you have any other models you want to clean them... Oh! Okay, so if the pumps are running too hot, if they're just getting hot, they're overheating, they're making noises, that's usually when I want to take a pump apart and clean it anyway. So if you haven't noticed it, and you know, if you're running it externally, you can put your hand on there and just see how it's doing. You can hear and see if there's a sound. But, uh, you know, when they're submersed, it's a little bit harder to know if they're running hot. But yeah, if they're getting clogged up, if they're dirty, then they can run a little bit warmer than they should. So we definitely want to stay on top of keeping them clean. Uh, Alan says, a six-foot tank, should the bottom be drilled or the back be drilled, and what drains are best? You know, uh, old-school method is the overflow box goes to the bottom of the tank, and the holes are in the bottom of the tank, and you just drain it that way. But a lot of people like those slim overflow boxes that hang up high, and they're very narrow, and, uh, you know, they drill through the back. So it really comes down to what you want to look at. I uh, Even with a tank now, the one you're looking in this video, my overflow box in this video is on the left side and it's out of sight. It's outside the frame of the window. My water flows straight across that panel that's on the left that looks kind of purplish. And there's a bunch of teeth up there and it flows into an external box that just drains straight down. I didn't want to put holes in the bottom of my tank because it's 400 gallons and I didn't want any of that water on the floor. And I have trust issues. And so I said, put all those holes in the external box hanging way up high. So that's what I did. But uh, it really comes down to, do you want the slim line, like the ghost overflow, on the back of your tank up high or on each end of the tank, for example, or do you want to have a corner overflow box that goes to the bottom? You know, it comes down to how much real estate you want to lose. In a six foot tank, you have room to play so you can decide what works best for you. But then once you know which box you're going to use, then that helps you decide where you're going to drill. Uh, Jared says, when are you going to set up a new nano tank? I don't know. Uh, Martina says, how do you clean if the impeller doesn't come out? There's something about the M1. Like I said, it's been so long since I cleaned it. But I feel like I was trying to remove it, and I was sure I was going to break it. And I think the L1 and the L2 comes out. And maybe the M2 comes out, but the M1 didn't. I think that was... The, or maybe I'm mixing it up with the pump inside of my vector, my, uh, my Nio skimmer. But there's one where I was prying on I was like, I'm just going to break this and have no pump in a minute here. I'm going to leave it alone. But uh, like I said, it's been so long. It's time for me to start taking things apart and cleaning them. This is that time of year. It's spring cleaning. It's a perfect time to soak things in citric acid and get them all cleaned up. So I'll get myself refreshed mentally because I'll start taking things apart and cleaning them and I'll start remembering things that I've forgotten. But yeah, I prefer to take out the impeller and clean it, clean the inside lining and uh, you know completely assemble it all nice and fresh. Alex says, why did you stop using bio pellets? I stopped using them because I wanted to try something else. Hey, Reef Dudes is here. So yeah, we're going to be doing a stream next week together. Devin and Mark together again. Um, Marcus said, I had them get stuck in there before I soaked for like four days in a vinegar bucket. The impeller got stuck in there. Uh, by the way, if you leave anything in vinegar too long, it can start to damage it. And what I mean by too long, like weeks. You know, like you just put in some vinegar and you threw it in a bucket and you're like, I'll clean it later. That can actually do some serious destruction to some things. 
Uh, Luke says, I heard urchins are beneficial to a reef tank. What are your thoughts? Certain urchins are a good choice, and certain ones are kind of aggressive. Uh, I love the tuxedo urchin. They go everywhere, and they just seem to do very little harm. They do pick up things on their back, like they might walk around with some zoanthids for a while or something, or a snail shell. But the diadema urchin is a really good one. The long spines that invariably will hit you right in the knuckle, and you'll remember you have an urchin suddenly. And uh, they are great at eating hair algae. But if your tank is made of acrylic, their, might, their mouth, their jaws, will scratch the acrylic. So if you see one anywhere near the front panel of an acrylic tank, you need to move it back onto the rock work or put it on the back wall or on the overflow box, but just know it can leave bite marks behind. Um, Brandon says, what about the waves? What's the cleaning schedule? I clean my Vortec uh, pumps about every three months. And I have extras that are clean, so what I can do is I can take a dirty one out, put the new one in, flow continues in my tank, and soak the dirty one inside citric acid or in vinegar water overnight and then deal with it tomorrow. And when it's clean, I can then swap it with the next one that's dirty and get the next one soaking. And I work my way rotation through all my vortex that way. It takes a few days to do it. Um, Jamie says, how many power heads would you recommend for a two foot cube and where would you position them? I'd probably put two in there. And I'd love to have them on the back so they're pointing forward. That would be a really cool way to do it because they kind of blend in, hopefully, and especially if the back of the tank is black. Then you have these pumps back there, like if you were using Vortex or gyres or, or uh, I don't know, whatever is out there on the market that you like, you can kind of make them sort of invisible and create that flow in the back of the tank. You, Depending on what kind you buy and what accessories they come with, you might be able to cycle them back and forth where they're crisscrossing or slave and anti-slave and get some really interesting flow patterns in your tank. But if you see dead zones, you may decide you have to add more later. The other choice is to put one in each end where you're crisscrossing across your reef and not put anything on the back. So it comes down to how your rock work is arranged and what kind of space you have to work with. Martinez, you uh, mentioned that your pump after four months was full of mom. Uh, I don't encounter, encounter that at all. I mean, I can take a pump apart a year from now, and there's a little bit of brown slime. It's not, uh, I don't use caulkwasser. Um, I use a calcium reactor, and uh, I don't get those weird things that other people deal with. But if you see a problem, if you see it frequently, then yeah, you got to stay on top of cleaning your equipment more frequently to stay ahead of it. Yeah, pencil urchins aren't great for reef tanks. They, um... They are sold in the trade, but they're usually not a good choice for our tanks. Uh, Tim says, have you measured the par on your reef? Not in a while. I measured it a couple of years ago for a Magna talk, which I gave and probably exists on the web. And if you watch that, you could find out all my numbers right there um, because BRS always releases those. But uh, I haven't, I don't remember the numbers. It's been a while. I've, I remember being very interesting that the backside of my reef had more par than the front. And I know that's because of the way the metal halide is installed in the in the reflector because of where the mogul socket is versus the tip of the bulb. And so it's doing the ricochet thing and it's sending light in a different way. And I didn't expect to find so much par down in the back on the sand in the back. And it explained why I have frags that are very happy way down there when you would think they would just die off and they don't. Hey, Chris Cross it says uh, he just heard the story about how I got started in acrylic and his story is very similar. See, we all get aggravated with something. That's when we decide to do it ourselves. Makes total sense. Uh, Brandon says, how do I know how much flow to use? I feel like I'm gambling when I adjust it. Well, sometimes, okay, so there's a couple ways to know how much flow you have in your tank. You can take your... Um, your equipment and turn it on and in a tank that has nothing going on you know let's just say you've barely stocked you have a few frags and that's about it you can put in some kind of a liquid additive that clouds the water and you can pour it in and watch how the cloud moves through the tank that's one way another method is you can take flake food and throw it in like confetti and see how it disperses throughout the tank 
and you can see where it's really moving fast and you can see where it's barely moving at all or where it just literally falls to the bottom like a rock. So that's a couple of ways to kind of measure flow in your tank. And then of course you have to look at the livestock and see how the livestock is responding. If the corals are closed up and miserable, they're probably getting too much flow because they're getting hammered by a power head. They're in a line of sight, you know, it's just getting hit with so much flow that it's uncomfortable. So in certain corals like a lot of flow and certain corals don't. Some just want a little bit. But we don't want to have so little flow in our tank that we end up with things like cyanobacteria growing in the system. So you have to find that sweet spot. So that's why I was suggesting pouring in something like uh, Purple Up, which is an additive we use to grow coralline algae. You can pour that in your tank and you can watch the cloud work its way through the tank over the next minute. Or, you know, like the next day you could try putting in flake food. Those are a couple of methods that are kind of a good way to demonstrate the flow in your tank and take away some of the mysticism and give you some specifics. Uh, Q-Ball says, any tips for rehousing a carpet anemone? I'm moving into a, moving into a 72 gallon and I'm worried about eating my fish. Carpet anemones eat fish. That's a real thing. So I don't know. I mean, if you're that worried about it and you don't want to take the chance, you might want to take it back to the fish store and let them um, sell it to someone else that can keep it. Oh, Devin suggests putting an air bubbler under the power head to see where the bubbles blow. That could work too. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you so much for coming to the live stream. We have another one next week. It'll be uh, 2 p.m. Central Time. Um, and uh, I loved all your questions. And if I didn't mention it once this stream, so I should really quick. We run a, a great group on Facebook called Club Milo's Reef. And I invited all the YouTube audience to come there so we can talk with each other all week and share pictures of our tank, ask questions. We don't let people put each others down. You know, we're very friendly. And uh, we have a great group of moderators that they help in this chat. They also help moderate the group on Facebook. So if you haven't been a member of it yet, here is your invitation. It's facebook.com slash groups slash Milos Reef. And uh, there's something like almost 8,000 members in there now. And it's just been a very slow growing group because I'm the one that adds the people. So I don't, uh, I don't add them quickly. There's like 100 people that have, are pending right now and I'm gonna go through those today and get them added. And uh, you know, if, you're, if you'd like to join us, you're welcome to, uh, as long as you're not an aggressive person. If you are a person that likes to pick fights and, and put people down, then we are not the group for you and there's no reason to join. So uh, you know, just giving a heads up to you from right from the beginning. When you join the group, when you're in, there's a video to watch with the rules. Be sure you watch it. It explains everything because there's no list of rules. You know how people always make a list you have to read and no one reads them? Well, I'm a video guy, so I made a video of the rules. <laughs> so check out the video. Find out what the operational system is for our group so you understand it. And that will avoid a lot of aggravation. And uh, hopefully you'll enjoy your, your stay with us and uh, realize that no one's guaranteed to stay there forever. The group was made to help people. And if I have to remove some people, I will. They still have access to the entire internet and YouTube, so they're not cut out of that. They're just no longer in the group. And that's just the best way for me to take care of the most amount of people in one area. And uh, I'm so far so good. So uh, thank you guys. I hope you have a great weekend, and I will see you next Saturday. Bye.